Good morning. We're going to get underway here. Um, got a full morning. We will take a break around 10 o'clock so people can stretch their legs and get a snack or whatever they need to do. Uh, um, so if we could take a quick go around the, the room and we'll find out who all's here and make sure that everybody who's here knows who we are. Okay? So if we might start with you, sir. I'm Curtis Reed. I am Executive Director of Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity. I'm Gary Scott, the Lieutenant with the State Police. Brenda Churchill, LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont. Karen Richards, Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. I'm Xander Landon, reporter with Vermont Digger. I'm Tom Walton, General Counsel for the Department of Human Resources. And uh, Commissioner Festigi will be here shortly. Thank you very much. Emily Adams, Attorney General's Office, Civil Rights Unit. Julio Thompson will be here a bit later this morning. Okay. Thank you. I'm Laura Subin. I'm a member of the Racial Justice Coalition. Diana Wally with the Community Equity Collaborative of Southeast Vermont. Okay. Thank you. And Emily, right? Yes. I'm Emily Miller, Office of Legislative Council. And, and Warren right can be the first one to introduce himself to our guests. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I'm, I'm Warren Kitzmiller. I represent Montpelier, so welcome to my district. Uh, and John? Um, John Gannon from Wilmington, representing Halifax, Whitingham, and Wilmington. Cindy Weed from Enosburg, representing Montgomery also. Rob Leclerc from Barrytown and formerly number one in the March Madness basketball bracket. <laughs> <laughs> and now embracing that status. Uh, yeah. okay. uh, Mega Townsend, South Burlington. Marsha Gardner-Richmond. Uh, Je this is Jessica Rumstead from Shelburne and St. George. She's lost a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jim Harrison, formerly the representative from Chittenden. Um, I understand that a member from Essex has moved to Chittenden and was on the news last night, and it says uh, representing Chittenden, so uh, oh, really? I, yeah. So I I used to be from Chittenden, Vermont, or I still am from Chittenden, Vermont. Um, but I also represent Menden, uh, Kelly, Bridge, Bridgewater, Bridgewater. Bridgewater. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Evidently, I don't know because oh, well, that's I'm why I wasn't there. at the meeting last night. <laughs> <laughs> Calm yourself. It's okay. It'll work out. <laughs> Patty, I'm Patty Lewis. I represent Berlin and Northfield. And I'm Dennis Devereaux from Mount Holly, and I represent Ludlow and Shrewsbury and finished second in the Merits Madness Pool and did win money, unlike <laughs> the other one. And missing next to Warren is Tristan Salino from Brattleboro, who has other responsibilities in the <laughs> All right. So um, I'm looking at the list that we have for today. And um, Mark Hughes is going to be coming at 9.30 as opposed to now. So hopefully things will work out so that at 9.30 we can put him on. And I didn't hear that Kate Logan was here. No, okay. But Curtis Reed is. So if you wouldn't mind being our first witness of the day. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is. Is this turned in the right direction? Yeah. Close, close, close enough. Close enough. Close enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the record, my name is Curtis Reed Jr., Executive Director of Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity. And for full disclosure, I serve as chair of the Vermont State Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. I'm a member of the Secretary of Education's Harassment, Hazing, and Bullying Commission. Uh, member of the State Police Fair and Impartial Policing Commission, and a founding member of the Community Equity Collaborative that serves southeastern Vermont. I've got to say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that is very impressive. Oh. And I kind of wish you'd gone a little more slowly. So. <laughs> but thank you. All right, I, I, will, I will read slower this time. <laughs> like that. Uh, in addition, uh, I have served or currently serve as a consultant and trainer in the areas of inclusive bias and economic development for a variety of state agencies, including the Vermont State Police, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, 
uh, the Department of Tourism and uh, Marketing, the Agency of Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife, and the Department of Human Resources. I also serve as a consultant and trainer in, in the area of diversity, inclusion, and equity for municipal governments, nonprofit organizations, and businesses in northern New England. <clears throat> um, as a black man in Vermont, I'm acutely aware of the devastating impact that white supremacy and racism have on my life and the life, lives of my children. Um, however, I hope that the committee understands and appreciates there is a wide diversity of socio-political and economic thought amongst Vermont's communities of color. Okay, we're not a monolithic block like uh, you might find in 2001, you know, the large monolithic block in the movie. No, we're, we're much more uh, diverse and nuanced than, than that. Um, and uh, while we may share the same goals to, to eradicate white supremacy and systemic racism, uh, our uh, the way in which you go about that is, is in some cases, radically different. Um, Vermont Partnership is chart was chartered in 1995. It is the oldest nonprofit organization in Vermont governed and managed by persons of color. Our current mission is to make Vermont an exceptional destination for everyone. Not everyone of a certain type, like not all redheads or not all men, um, but for everyone. Uh, we are in year 15 of a 40-year initiative um, called Vermont Vision for a Multicultural Future. Um, we have suppressed our socialization about instant gratification. We know that cultural shifts take time and that we are committed to uh, working in an organic fashion in order for that to, uh, to take place. Um, we launched with the Department of Tourism and Marketing uh, the Vermont African American Heritage Trail. Uh, we believe that our economic future is directly tied to our ability to attract service beyond expectation uh, and retain uh, consumers of color from all over the state. Um, African Americans spend $83 billion uh, on tourism and travel in the United States. Our best guesstimate is about 10 million of that 83 billion found its way into Vermont. Um, so there's a, there is, a, you know, I've been paying taxes in Vermont for 40 years, and the only way they're going to get more <laughs> is that if we have more consumers here, and, and we believe that uh, that there is an untapped market uh, for uh, outdoor enthusiasts, uh, college students. Um, uh, families um, of color uh, to really see Vermont as that destination. Um, that it is critically important that uh, we shape state government, but also the private sector in such a way that we are attracting and retaining um, uh, business in this new marketplace. Uh, so we come at this from really an economic uh, uh, argument as opposed to a social moral. Uh, uh, point of view. Um, we also hold, we hold an annual conference, the uh, Vermont Vision for Multicultural Future Conference, uh, where we bring together uh, executive level, legislative level, uh, community level leadership. Uh, it's sort of an, a marketplace to exchange uh, promising practices, things that are working in one place. Uh, might work in another place, uh, in another agency or another government. Um, we believe in state government. We believe that there are things happening in state government that are good and positive. And we want to build on those. Uh, we build off of this asset model, which is, um, yeah, there are good things that are happening, but maybe the next agency over, the next department over, might not know good thing that is happening. Um, we tend to work in silos, and the purpose of this conference, this annual conference, is to pull people out of their silos, uh, particularly the ones that are doing what we consider uh, exceptional work in this field, um, and to sort of cross-pollinate their experiences with, uh, with others that may not um, 
may not be doing that work, or may not see the work in the same fashion. And you know, I can sit and talk until I'm almost blue in the face, but that so certainly is not going to happen. Uh, but it's much more powerful when the secretary of one agency says to a secretary of another agency, or a commissioner of one agency says to a commissioner of another agency, look, uh, this is what we've done, and these are you know, tangible results of the work that we've been engaged in. Um, the, um, and, and one such, and, you know, we've been working with state police for, um, goodness, going on like 14 years now. Um, but the, 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 the shift is slow, but it is in fact, uh, um, it, it's happening in ways that we can, we can measure. I'm going to just pass around. Um, this is the most recent, this actually is hot off the press from yesterday. Um, traffic stop data, where we're looking at, at uh, traffic stops of blacks and whites. And those who were searched, and you'll see from 2015 to 2016, is where precipitous drop in those searches. Um, and this is because state police has leadership. Oh, here, I, I, there we go. Uh, has dedicated leadership uh, sort of addressing uh, systemic racism and, uh, and racial disparity. But it's taken them 14 years to get to where they are today. Um, but they have a model that could easily be transplanted to other agencies. And this is what brings me to when we talk about 281. Um, there is, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to ask that the name be changed from civil rights officer to chief mitigation officer. Okay, let's get this one. Okay. Mitigation officer. Right. Uh, this is more than just about civil rights, and it, it sort of conflates the issue, uh, at least from a marketing standpoint. Uh, of, of having uh, a chief that is sufficiently vague, but at the same time, when asked, well, mitigation of what? Then it gets into the whole conversation about systemic racism. It gets into, you know, kind of the, um, looking at the best practices within state government. So what's the title of your? Mitigation, chief mitigation officer. Okay. Thank you. It, it takes it out of that slippery slope of morality and um, of um, sort of social thought that we're really looking at, you know, how do we mitigate systems as they relate to X, Y, or Z. In section, <clears throat> under the duties, um, The first thing we have is to oversee a comprehensive organizational review to identify systemic racism in each of those three branches. I think that needs to be preceded with the identification of, of practices that eliminate um, or address systemic racism. Oftentimes, we spend our time totally focused on what's wrong to the extent that we lose sight of what's right and what's been affected. Um, and so I would add something, you know, oversee a comprehensive organizational review to identify efforts to address uh, systemic racism and racial disparities uh, as the very first thing. We want, we want to, to accentuate the positive uh, going into this work. Um, as opposed, and as part of this, our asset model, as opposed to a deficit model. Could you, could you repeat that, your suggestion? The suggestion that we... Uh, Oversee compre comprehensive review to identify... To identify um, uh, efforts to address systemic racism and racial disparities. Thank you. Okay. You, you will find that um, 
State Police has done an incredible job over the last 14 years. You'll find that the Agency of Tourism uh, and Marketing uh, and the Agency of Commerce has done a commendable job. You'll find that the Department of Transportation uh, you know, has also been doing a really good job around uh, recruitment, around um, you know, uh, workplace training. Uh, and, and so we're, we're saying let's, let's give credit where credit is due. As a starting point, um, and as a point that would encourage others that may not be doing the work, to say, "Look, you know, Commissioner Anderson, don't don't tell me that that you can't do it," because Commissioner Anderson would say, "You know, we're doing it in our department." Um, you know, Mike Sherling, um, you know, would, would say to someone, "Well, no." Yeah, don't tell me that you can't do it because we're doing it in our agency. Uh, we think that is a much more powerful starting point than the starting point of, you know, you folks are really bad. You're not doing the right thing. And that's not the purpose of this body. We believe that it should be inspirational in the sense that we have um, some agencies and some departments that are doing a really good work. Um, and we, we would like to see others that are, that will either match or exceed the work that they do. I just want to review the agencies which you mentioned. Do I have it correct if I have down here? Commerce, transportation, tourism, and public safety? Correct. Thank you. Um, and there, there may be others out there. Those are the ones that, that come into our orbit. Uh, you might want to add fish and wildlife uh, as well. Um, and you might be scratching your heads and saying, why fish and wildlife? Well, you know, we're trying to attract uh, Dominican fly fishermen to come up to Vermont. And the question is, well, will we be safe here? You know, um, Vermont has this progressive liberal veneer, well, you know, we have this persona of being a progressive liberal state, uh, but is there something beneath that progressive liberal veneer that says the folks of color don't come here? And we're saying that, no, there, there's really good reason to come to Vermont, um, you know, to visit uh, any of the sites on African American Heritage Trail, um, you know, adventure capitalists of color that ask me, well, you know, Vermont, like, what's in Vermont? Uh, and uh, you know entrepreneurs, you know that, that are looking to relocate. Uh, so, you know our experience runs the gamut from uh, you know fly fishermen to you know tech companies to uh, you know folks that are engaged in, in the arts. Uh, and so, fish and wildlife is in there because you know we've got people that fish and hunt and camp and. So the, the, the paradigm shift that we'd like to create with this particular piece of legislation is focusing on that which is good, that which has been effective over time, and let's replicate that as a starting point, as opposed to a starting point of state government is the pits. You don't do anything right. Uh, everything you do is bad. Um, there is a, uh, a clarion call to attack when we're saying, no, that's, that's not where we come from. Uh, we think that, uh, I mean, I love Vermont. Uh, there are tons of folks of color that love Vermont who want to see, see state government uh, do better. And we think this is one way in which that that, that might happen. Um, so uh, otherwise, I think the, the I, I think the bill is 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 great uh, with those two exceptions of changing the name and then adding that um, sort of a, number one as the preamble in, 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 in many ways. So the assumption that uh, there are good things that are happening in the state government, we want to flush them out, shine a bright light on them, so that others can in fact follow. 
Thank you very much. And we've got some questions lined okay. up. Okay. Very much appreciate the the glass half full mm -hmm. approach. Well, it's three quarters full. Even <laughs> <laughs> better. Uh, we've got Jim and Marcia. Curtis, thank you. Um, the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, have affiliates in other states or is it strictly a Vermont? We are, we are a Vermont phenomenon. Okay. However, uh, New Hampshire and Maine are interested in the model that we that we've been promoting here okay. uh, in, in those states. We've worked really closely with the uh, Endowment for Health uh, in Maine, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the uh, NAACP chapters that are uh, in the Manchester area. Okay. It, where I was going with it, um, and, and you may or may not um, be aware, but um, what the bill asks us to set up um, uh, from what we've learned yesterday is may be unique, um, but I'm, I'm curious if you know of other states that have set up similar independent commissions, chief officers, etc. cetera, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, if you were part of a national group, you might have ready information on that. So I, I can maybe tell you it's that. an unfair question, so. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the only state that has taken this on. Okay. There are some cities that have taken it on, like you know Portland or Seattle, uh, I think, or, or two. Um, uh, as well as Burlington, I mean, Burlington, Vermont, uh, has a strategic plan for diversity and equity. They've been working on it for the last three years. They've got incredible uh, sort of quantitative data. Have they set up a commission in Burlington? There is, um, city council has a standing committee on uh, diversity and equity. Um, the mayor reports back to them on an annual basis uh, in terms of progress. Um, you know, this is more of, a, in one respect, a kind of an enforcement uh, arm. It's got subpoena powers. Right. This is the only one. Okay. No, that's that's um, um, that's good to know. Um, I also appreciate, um, you know, pointing out some of the positives and progress, uh, perhaps overall that we've made. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious as to as I look at this. Um, new board commission, new officer. Um, how do you think this will change it to get that other quarter, if the glass is three quarters full? Mm -hmm. um, one is looking at data. One, uh, one <coughs> this is really about sort of the economic argument of why it's really important to um, address issues of systemic racism and racial disparities, that there's an economic argument to that. And you know, in a state that needs 27, uh, 11,000 new workers annually just to maintain our current economic status, the fact that we have the lowest birth rate in the nation, the fact that we have the, the uh, second highest age you know, 18% yeah, of us. Yeah, are, we have a few uh, obstacles. Yeah, <laughs> we, 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 we have some challenges in, yeah. in, 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 in yeah. front of us. Um, that we really need to have everyone on board uh, sort of addressing uh, these issues um, so that, um, you know, we do become the exceptional destination for a marketplace that we're just now beginning to uh, enter into. Um, so whether it's looking at health care, whether it's looking, I mean, it's, if you want to attract retirees, you know, if you want to sort of repopulate Wake Robin, um, you know, with the, 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 the current demographic trend, then, you know, you need to have a, um, you know, uh, health care that's responsive to uh, the needs of uh, a more culturally diverse and racially diverse population. Okay, so, but it, it, specifically on this commission, it sounds like uh, more data you feel would be helpful. There is an abundance of data okay. currently. What we don't have is we don't have an inventory of effective practices. Okay. We can go to the Department of Health, we can go to any of the other departments, and um, most for the most have disaggregated data by race. 
Um, and for the most part, it doesn't look too good. Uh, however, there's no inventory of effective practices that would move to change those numbers. For example, from we're working with our third commission, our second commissioner and third colonel state police. We know that in the transition memo from one um, top leadership to the next includes specific language around fair and impartial policing. So there's continuity, even though it, you know, Flynn left and then you know Anderson came in and you know Jim Baker was there, the Thomas Bronx, and now Matt Birmingham. In those transition memos, from one to the other, is really clear language around fair and impartial policing. So that work that started 14 years ago with state police, you're seeing the evidence of that in the paper that I just passed around to you a few minutes ago. Um, <coughs> same with tourism, transportation, uh, equally as well. That uh, those transition memos uh, really focus on areas that seek to reduce racial disparities. Now, are they getting there overnight? No. <clears throat> but we know in terms of effective practices that when an outgoing secretary or an outgoing commissioner includes language around racial disparities, you have a much better shot at that happening than simply you know, it falling by the wayside or getting, you know, falling through the cracks. Um, so it's, it's helping each agency sort of identify um, those leverage, those, uh, those um, points of leverage that you will know, <coughs> over time uh, the kinds of changes that we think um, would make the reduction or elimination of racial disparities um, and addressing the system of racism. Um, All set mm -hmm. uh, We've got now Marsha Dennison Rawls. Thank you. Um, I think you addressed some of my questions already, but uh, I'll ask them anyway. Okay. Um, do you feel that this panel can make a difference? Part two. And I, too, appreciate your positive outlook. Um, so my next question is, how do you see this panel and um, the new chief mitigation officer working within state government? Okay. Well, the short answer is yes, okay. that they um, can make a difference, and, and that they will make a difference. Uh, how they do that? Um, it's really sort of the skill of the chief mitigation officer in communicating, uh, first and foremost, that this is not a witch hunt, that this is about um, identifying effective practices and moving those effective practices from one department or agency to another department or agency. If the message is, you're bad, and we're going to come get you, and <coughs> that that leads to a level of dysfunction that will sort of hamstring the, the work of this particular body, which is why it's important to add, what I, in my opinion, to add that initial piece around uh, identifying promising practices, effective practices. Dennis, Rob, so yesterday we heard from uh, Senator Colin Moore and uh, Representative Christie on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, on page two on the advisory panel in the center of it, it talks about uh, the panel they consult with the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council and the Vermont Human Rights Commission and others. So uh, the question for them and maybe some others in the room would want to answer it too is, uh, how is this advisory panel going to differ, or what are they going to do differently than, than the governor's uh, council and the commission that are already involved with these issues? Is, is, 
I, I'm not sure if we there's a need mm -hmm. uh, beyond to go beyond or maybe expand the council and the commission. But uh, I just sure would ask that. Um, the these other bodies are really into the week. Uh, Human Rights Commission really deals with individual cases, uh, the workforce development, um, you know, is providing, um, well, I think they just recently had their mandate was, was slightly changed uh, in the, in, during the session, so. Um, they're really working around episodic events and this panel is really strategic in, in terms of looking long term um, and moving the dial in a way that is um, uh, sort of addresses these sort of root causes, uh, but in a way that is focused on the economic benefit at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, that's, and, you know, I, and, and I, and one of the reasons of, of changing the name from civil rights to mitigation um, is when we think about civil rights, we're thinking about the individual as opposed to the collective. Um, and we want to really speak to what this individual and what this panel will do, which is sort of the mitigation of, of um, of um, uh, systemic racism and racial disparities. Thank you. I think you may have answered my question, but I'll see. Um, <clears throat> I want to say you sound like you're very busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if this position was to come to fruition, mm -hmm. as you heard, we have a lot of people here from a lot of organizations, um, very diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, would you anticipate that any of these, there wouldn't be a need for them anymore? I guess, if, another way to say it, if this position was, again, to come to fruition, what organizations that are in place now in positions would you envision there wouldn't be a need for? You mean in the activist community or, or, or within state government? Um, I, I would say all. If, if. Uh, I cannot think of an activist organization whose, <clears throat> whose mission it is to work themselves out of business. Okay? Um, we put a timeline on ours as, at 40 years that we anticipate that uh, in 40 years, uh, Vermont would be in a position uh, of being one that exceptional destination with all the supports and services that go along with that. Um, and that our economic survival is critically dependent upon that. Um, and we figured 40 years should be, you know, sort of the right time for that to happen. Um, I don't, given the, given the human nature, there are always sort of issues that will arise. Um, you know, when, you know, the March of Dimes eliminated polio, they moved into birth defects. You know, I mean, so it, it really depends on, on those individual organizations. I think within state government, uh, what we what we are looking for is the uh, internalization of best practices around eliminating racial disparities. Uh, I think state police is the furthest along in that process. Um, they have a standing fair and impartial policing commission. Uh, <coughs> that will you know, continue to provide them long into the future uh, advice and, co and, and, and counsel on um, data collection, practices, training um, um, for, for troopers. And in, in many ways, being an ambassador to other law enforcement agencies that ought to be doing what they're doing, um, whether it's in sheriff's departments or local PDs. So. Um, you know, we we would like to think that um, someone asked me, "When am I going to retire?" And you know, my response is, "Well, when people are good, then I can retire." <laughs> <laughs>
they hear enough good people around. Thank you. Uh, Cindy and then John. Yeah, I'm just looking for some clarification. On this sheet here, it looks like there's not as many searches going on, you know, mm -hmm. as there used to be. Correct. And it looks like it's pretty low, actually, like really low Correct. on this paper here. Right. But this article in the Rutland Herald by these Vermont professor and the Cornell University professors, the minorities in Vermont are over-searched. But well, it, this data does not, to me, look like they're being over-searched. Okay. Um, are there any data geeks in, in, in the room? There's, there's this. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, there, there are. There, there's this, this notion of the, the tyranny of small numbers. Okay. okay. Um, and you know the data. So it drops from 57 searches to 22 searches. Mm -hmm. You know, from 2015 to 2016. Um, you know, out of those 22 searches, 19 contraband was found. I think the national average for found contraband across the board is somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. Yeah, so it's, it's about 10, 10 to 12 percent of, um, of searches result in contraband. Vermont State Police, whether you're black or white, can be stopped. The hit rates are in the mid 80s, um, which has to do with the kind of training that that they've been um, um, <coughs> that they go through, uh, and and also in terms of supervision, uh, that over the last several years has reduced the number of of searches uh, or stops and searches of of um, motorists of, of of color. Um, so yeah, there's this notion of being over-searched, which statistically um, is true, but in the context, um, we would argue uh, differently. So it's still an issue. It's still an issue. What you're arguing. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's still an issue, um, <coughs> and the you know part of the as they drill down, one of the things that state police can do is they can drill down into this data. So we'll take a look at the, at the, at the 22 that, that were stopped. Um, you know, or the 22 that were searched. Were there other circumstances that prompted the search? We don't know that. Was, was it, you know, because there's a mandatory ticket or a mandatory citation, uh, and that's set up in the mind of the trooper, Oh, if they're guilty of one thing, then there might be something else happening, or if they're observing uh, behavior in the vehicle, or they're seeing things in the vehicle. So, you know that that this is a point where data is driving um, supervision issues, is driving training issues, um, and ultimately, um, what will be better service uh, to to the broader community. Um, so yes, out of the you know fifty almost fifty thousand stops that were made, um, twenty two black motorists were searched. Thank you, mm -hmm. John. Um, so, so Curtis, I mean, given that there are some good models in state government already that, mm -hmm. that are addressing systemic racism, I was just wondering the, the, the panel makeup. Is you know every, every member is appointed by a different organization, the Senate mm -hmm. Committee on Committees, the Speaker of the House, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, the Governor, and the Human Rights Commission. The only restriction is they can't be a, a legislator. Um, do, do you think it's important to have someone with state government experience on the panel um, that's had some you know success with addressing these issues or not? I'm just sure. Um, no. Okay. That, the, the short answer is, is no. Uh, what this panel is providing is an objective outside look of state government. And it's, it's difficult to do that from within. So, and, the, and we fully support having 
you know, a variety of agencies making appointments. I mean, how many different organizations are represented on the on the um, on the Milk Commission or on the Access Board or Human Rights Commission? Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, this is um, parallel to that in the, in the sense that you know we want to have a broad um, representation um, from agencies that are in fact critical to the success, but at the same time we don't want we want a certain level of uh, of independence. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the focus of this particular bill is to promote racial justice reform. We know that there are many types of bias and misunderstanding. If we, if this bill's scope was broad, in your opinion, would that render it ineffective or because the scope would be so wide or not? It would need to be a narrow scope. Uh, one, because, and again, my own personal bias is really around economic development. Okay. And, you know, the market that we're looking to, to attract um, is really around the, the social identity around race. Uh, and so to really narrow, or, or if you want to broaden the, the, the mandate, then you lose the possibility of sort of focusing and being laser um, um, with laser preci precision in, in, a, in a new market that we're trying to really a attract. So I would, I would not be in favor of, of um, expanding the scope of this particular uh, advisory body. Just um, not, to, not a question, but more of a statement. I really do appreciate coming at it from the need to attract more people to Vermont. Mm -hmm. We do. So, of all colors. Right. If you can be a productive member of our society, work, raise a family, we need it all. And so. pay taxes. And pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Sure. Well, that's, like I said, you know, we, we, we um, are bullish on Vermont. Uh, we think that Vermont can serve as a model for the rest of the nation because where we see the demographic trend happening nationwide is from urban to rural. And states like Montana, Idaho, the Dakotas, Minnesota, you know, Upper Michigan, do not have a model around which to uh, address these issues. Um, and, and so we'd like to sort of position Vermont uh, in a way that is a national leader uh, in um, addressing systemic racism and reducing racial disparities because for us, it's market driven. In other places, it may be driven by something else. But for us, uh, our particular viewpoint is that this is a market-driven initiative um, that will bring more people here, and that will, um, you know, increase increase uh, our, our revenues. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you just one <coughs> quick story, if I might. So, um, state troopers have been trained to no longer ask the question, do you know why I pulled you over? Okay? State trooper stops you, they will introduce themselves, they will tell you why they pulled you over, and they'll ask the all-important question, is there a reason for that? They've shifted their, their um, focus from uh, being enforcers to being guardians. Mm -hmm. Last year, um, there was a black visitor to the, to, to the state. Um, he got in his vehicle uh, at the airport, drove to, was on his way to Montpelier, and um, uh, had a phone call that he needed to respond to with a text message. So he pulled over to the side of the road. Uh, and 10 minutes on the side of the road, there's a flashing blue lights in his rearview mirror. And he says, oh, well, I won't say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But, uh, you know, this black man rolled down his window. He saw the trooper get out of his vehicle. Um, the trooper said, is everything okay? Mm -hmm. This guy was like dumbfounded. And, 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 and again, you know, the trooper said, is, is everything okay? And he said, yeah, you know, I, I, I saw the signs coming out of the airport, no handheld devices, da da da. And, uh, and the trooper said, well, you know, have a nice day, and, and turned around and went back to his vehicle. By the time this gentleman reached Montpelier, he's the director of uh, the League of Cities and Towns, and was here to visit um, Mara uh, Carroll, who's the Vermont executive director <coughs> for um, uh, League of Cities and Towns. This guy could not stop talking about he had an encounter with law enforcement that did not assume that he was a criminal. He's traveling around the country talking about, you know, Vermont and his experience here. But more importantly, what he did was he held his national conference in Vermont this past summer. Probably about $2 million of extra, extra revenue that came to Burlington all because of his encounter with a state trooper that exceeded his expectations around law enforcement. That's what we need, and that's what we hope that this panel will be able to do, to be able to bring that kind of, of uh, uh, ethics into other parts of government. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, you're not on our list, correct? Yeah. You're not on our list till tomorrow. Correct. Would you rather wait till tomorrow as opposed to follow up directly to? Yeah, I was going to wait. Uh, wait, OK. I just wanted to check. Sure. <laughs> um, Lieutenant Scott from the State Police. Uh, all right. Next on the list for today, I'm just going right down the list, we have um, Representation from the AG's office, the Civil Rights Unit. Do we have? Julio was planning on being here at 10. At 10? Okay, I need to make a note of that. And then Mr. Hughes said 9.30. Um, would there be an individual who was planning on, on um, talking with us today who would be able to talk with us for 10, 15 minutes? I think I'm on the list. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and, and who was it? I heard the voice. Christine. Uh, yes, absolutely. If you wouldn't mind. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Christine. Uh, we had you down for tomorrow, but you're in the oh, chair right sorry. now, so <laughs> have at it. We'll thank you. Okay, I'll switch here. Christine. <coughs> Mm -hmm. and was it you, if I recall correctly, who had submitted some written testimony? I did, and I actually resubmitted something because what, I, yeah. Yeah, what mm -hmm. I submitted was a little bit um, that was I up. Yeah. Yes. And, and I do have... Thursday, so I got to change it back. Yeah, and I have, I mean, I think I have like one or two copies when I printed it. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, it was forwarded yeah. to the but committee I could send this it. morning. Okay. Yeah. All right. so, so thank you. Um, and I don't think I'll be wrong. I do, you know, I, was, I came in the room as Could Curtis. Could you identify oh, yourself sorry. for the record, please? Oh. Thank you. Um, by name see. and by position. Right. My name is Christine Longmore. I've lived in Burlington um, since uh, somewhere in the 70s. I came here with my family. My dad was a IBM transplant from New York. Um, and in terms of, you know, different ways that I've served, I... Um, one of the first ways that I got involved in racial justice was um, really in like 1982 when the KKK was coming here to hold a rally in our state, I think maybe it was somewhere in the south, and a rally at City Hall happened and um, I think it was Phil Fermonti who pushed me out on the front of City Hall to, um, you know, to just protest that. Um, I served as one of the co-founders of Uncommon Alliance, a grassroots organization 
led by people of color that um, to establish it, to eliminate racial disparities in the justice system. And Uncommon Alliance was um, the really, you know, grassroots organization that was the impetus of the first race data collection project in traffic stops in Vermont up in the Chittenden County area. Um, I also serve as the chair of the Burlington Police Commission. My three-year term expires in June of 2018, that's this year. I participated for um, a year or so in the Vermont State Police's Fair and Impartial Policing Committee. I also served as the chair of the Attorney General's Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in Juvenile and Criminal Justice System of Vermont. I resigned after six months, and I think this is pretty significant to this conversation and to the consideration of everybody in this room. One of the reasons that I resigned is because the work really rested on, on volunteer work. And if any, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the charge of Act 54, but if you look at the charge, it's, it's huge and it's incredible and it's very overwhelming. And from really from day one, my, my first strategy was to go <coughs> out and talk to people like Karen and, and the ACLU and everybody I could think of just to show them the charge and say, how is this going to be done? So I, I served as chair for six months. We submitted a report in the midst of some controversy about the process that we used to submit that report. Um, but yeah, so I served for six months and then resigned, and I think they're in the process of um, appointing a new chair and vice chair. Um, let's see. I also wanted to just pick up on something that I heard you asking about, um, about s similar efforts in other states. In Maine, um, there was a Racial Justice Commission established in 2011. I'm not sure if, if the, you know, what all the details are about that, but Maine has similar demographics. Um, and so I, I guess I'll just read the rest of it. It's, it's not, my testimony is not too long. Um, as you're hopefully aware, the Human Rights Commission is barely equipped to address explicit bias. Um, and explicit bias are acts of blatant racism, like cross burning or calling someone nigger. Systemic racism, explicit bias, and implicit bias are obviously related, but they're three distinct manifestations of racism and constructs of white supremacy. And I think it's really important for people to understand that. I think Curtis was talking about that a little bit, but I think as you make decisions about this and as you learn about this, um, this uh, issue and, and look at the details of the bill that's trying to address it, that it's really important to understand the difference between systemic racism, explicit bias, and implicit bias. They're, they're all related, but they're different manifestations of the same problem. Um, I agree with Curtis that I, I think that it makes sense for us to consider it from an economic perspective, but as an individual, I see it more as a social and moral issue, but I think that it's all related. I mean, obviously, if we're suffering socially or morally, it's going to connect to our economics as well, you know? But I think in terms of our perspective, or me as an individual, I see it as a, a social and moral issue. Um, systemic racism is responsible for deep suffering. It's hard for you to understand and acknowledge because you're white and because of privilege and because of fragility and denial um, and however those happen, vice versa, I'm not sure which one, that's the other one, um, and our lack of diversity in the state of Vermont. Um, I think that there's a lack of ability, ability or willingness to understand the extent and impact of this problem, and that doesn't make it less real for the people who experience it every day. As public servants, you're responsible for defending, defending all Vermonters' rights to live in freedom with equal opportunities and protection. Whether you're willing to accept, this, accept it or not, it's the truth. And the truth of systemic racism is that you, me, and our children are all harmed by it. Until we can identify, measure, and improve our ability to ensure equal opportunities in employment, education, health care, etc., our state is failing in an inexcusable way. The fact that Vermont jails have been populated for as long as I've been watching it, which is like decades, disproportionately by black and brown people is, a re is the result of one of two things. These two possible explanations are mutually exclusive of each other. 
Black and brown people are disproportionately represented in our jails because we are inherently more criminal. I hope you don't believe that. Or we are being unjustly arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated because of our skin color and racial profiling. In fact, a black driver is almost four times as likely to be searched as a white driver in Vermont, which gets back to Professor Seguino and Brooks's um, study that was just released. The fact that our children are expelled from school at disproportionate rates than their white classmates is either because our children inherently have behavior problems or a lack of respect for authority or, and I hope you don't believe that, our children are often responding negatively to being mistreated by the adult educators our state pays to educate our children and who are racially bullied by classmates, neighbors, and other <coughs> community members. In recent, and this is another thing that I am sort of picking up on in the previous conversation, and I think this is really important. I would ask that you guys maybe circle back with um, Ken Schatz and Karen Bastine of DCF. They're actually doing some work to address racial disparities in that department. Um, my former capacity as a chair of the attorney, as a, a uh, advisory board on racial disparities in the juvenile and criminal justice system, I've been talking about the possibility of designating black and brown children and youth in the custody of DCF, Woodside, and adopted children as a vulnerable population. And they're supportive of presenting this possibility to the Department of Mental Health. And I think that's something that's really important for people to um, consider. And I'm going to have another conversation with Karen and Ken about that. I know that it's a little bit late in the game to try to add this to the bill, but I think that it's worth all of us thinking about it. And I think that there's a um, education uh, bill that it could also be appropriate to tag that on to there. I think that um, there's information about the wages that Vermonters, that people of color that are Vermonters earn um, being very low. And I think, again, black and brown Vermont, and, and the answer and the, the explanation for that is either that black and brown Vermonters are lacking in professional capabilities, I hope you don't believe that, or because we don't get hired or promoted at a rate equal to our similarly <coughs> qualified white coworkers. Um, and I think I just made another reference to the, the information that uh, Professor Savino and Professor Brooks have put out there, and I would again encourage you to read that report. It's called The Deeper Dive into Racial Disparities in Policing in Vermont. And, you know, as the questions were asked, and, and I know that Curtis is a big fan of the Vermont State Police, and I, I am in a lot of ways too. I think that what we have is a model that we can look at, but I think that's very different than looking at the results that that data collection is really showing us and what, and it's still showing that we have a problem. I think it's also really significant to, to note that there are at least 79 plus uh, police agencies around the state that are required by law to be collecting that data and I don't think that they are, which is pretty significant. I mean, if it's mandated by law and these police organizations are not doing that, I think that that's cause for concern. Um, I also would like to just bring your attention to the fact that there is a lot of um, information out there that really puts um, experiencing racism and linking it to PTSD. Um, there's an article entitled The Link Between Racism and PTSD in Psychology Today. It was uh, published in 2015. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Psychologist explains race-based stress and trauma in black Americans. It's important to understand that race-based stress and trauma extends beyond the direct behaviors of prejudiced individuals. We are surrounded by constant reminders that race-related danger can occur at any time anywhere to anyone. You might see clips on the nightly news featured, featuring unarmed African Americans being killed on the street, in a holding cell, or even in a church. Learning of these events brings up an array of painful racially charged memories and what has been termed vicarious traum traumatization. Even if the specific tragic news items has never happened to us directly, we've had parents or aunts 
who have had similar experience or we know people in our community who have, and their stories have been passed down. Over the centuries, the black community has developed a cultural knowledge of these sorts of horrific events, which then primes us for the traumatiz traumatization when we hear about yet another act of violence. Another unarmed black man being has been shot by police in our communities and nowhere feels safe. And it goes on, there's a little bit more there, but I just think that it's really important for people to um, understand that that's a real piece of our experience. The issue of systemic racism in Vermont is widespread. It has been documented. It causes destruction and suffering beyond what any of you I can imagine will ever understand. We have a potential model to address systemic racism in the work of the Vermont State Police um, and their commitment to fair and impartial policing with race tra traffic stop data analyzation review. But again, you know, it's, it's a model that I think can be used in other places in state government, but it's also really important to pause and understand that that model is still putting out information that reveals that there are racial disparities in policing. So let's not celebrate too quick. 50 years ago today, when I was three years old, Dr. or actually, I guess, is it today? It's either today or tomorrow. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I wonder how any of you as parents would have explained to your children why a great man like Dr. King was killed. What we have to tell our children is racism is real. It's wrong, and even when you experience it, you still have to respect your teachers, adults, your white classmates, your neighbors, store owners, owners and the institutions you have to navigate in order to be successful in our society. Above all, don't respect the police. Do whatever they tell you to do because it can be a matter of life and death. You have a duty as public servants to work diligently for the protection of rights of non-white Vermonters and white Vermonters. You have a duty to hold individuals accountable for, for their own role in systemic racism in the agencies and organizations that employ them. The failure to do this with a sense of urgency is a neglect of your sworn duty as elected officials. Thank you for your service to the state. Thank you. Uh, committee questions? Christine? I also do think that it's important to have systemic racism in the title. I mean, I know there's been a lot of different conversations about that, but that's what the bill is intended to address. And I think that, you know, even down the road as the work goes on, as new people come in and people are trying to learn about the work of um, that body, that it should just be called what it is. Thank you. Committee, no questions? Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. And it's a little past 9.30, but Mr. Hughes has arrived. And if you are, if you've had a chance to catch your breath, you would like to take the witness chair, please. I live in Cabot, and it's mud season, and I have two Petri dishes that I had to take to school, so. Uh, <clears throat> my phone jumped, and so that I can go on and on, but there's, um, thank you for having me. For the record, Mark Hughes. <clears throat> As I fumble around, I think I have some notes. <clears throat> and you are representing which, which of the, the groups that wanted to speak with us? <clears throat> I am the executive director and co-founder of Justice for All. <clears throat> the anchor of the Racial Justice Reform Coalition who put this bill forward. <clears throat> Thank you for providing me an opportunity to speak on S-281 today. Uh, in spite of all of the adversity getting here, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, the bill is a very important uh, bill uh, that addresses uh, systemic racism. Uh, I'm an Iowa native. Uh, I'm a resident uh, in Vermont now for the last nine years, and I'm a retired Army officer. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a cybersecurity expert, a father, a grandfather. I'm an ordained minister in the Baptist faith. I'm a member uh, and, uh, and a, for, a former ex executive board, uh, 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 as well as chaplain of the American Legion here, post three in, in Montpelier. Uh, I'm also a member of the Veterans of Foreign War uh, and also Veterans for Peace. There's a, uh, a board that I serve on with Rights and Democracy called C4. Uh, there's a, uh, a position that I hold as the tri-chair of the uh, 
the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Uh, I'm a former co-chair in uh, racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory <coughs> panel. I've also served as the Vermont Democratic Party affirmative action uh, chair, uh, also formerly the Cabot Town chair, uh, and also a member of the platform committee that would be the Democratic Party formally. Uh, I'm the co-founder and executive director of Justice for All, as I've said. I'm, uh, this is a racial justice uh, organization with a mission to pursue racial justice with Vermont's, within Vermont's criminal justice system through advocacy, education, and relationship building. <clears throat> justice for All is a member organization of the State uh, Police Fair and Impartial uh, Policing Committee. Uh, we also have uh, worked with the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee uh, uh, Policy Committee uh, since 2015. And we've served uh, on uh, the Law Enforcement Professional Regulation uh, Summer Study, which was foundational, a foundational step in move, moving the uh, law enforcement towards professional regulation, as you might recall. <coughs> I believe that's S-193. Uh, last year, we uh, formed a racial reform, racial justice reform coalition of 30 organizations. And those 30 organizations uh, moved forward. We introduced uh, what was then H-492. Uh, H-492 culminated in what you know and now understand as Act 54. And uh, it's uh, this, this coalition uh, anchored by Justice for All, uh, it's us who brought S-281 to your attention. Uh, and uh, we did the same thing with H-868, it's right there on the board, over there, it's the sister bill. And the first person we talked to about that was your own Representative Warren Kitzmiller. So he was the first one to bring that one to the Legislative Council and open the door for it to come into the House. <coughs> I want to share some very important thoughts today uh, on uh, uh, systemic racism and uh, co in contrast a little bit to overt racism as well. And um, doing so, um, what we can do is just, uh, maybe um, shine a little bit of light based upon the testimony that I, I uh, witnessed yesterday. See, after uh, introduction and initial testimony yesterday, uh, I felt it necessary to hit the reset button on my testimony. Uh, it seems that um, there is a discussion and some background on you know, what it is that we're trying to do surrounding systemic racism. I think it would be fair to the committee, uh, if allowed to do so, to provide some of that background information. Uh, I'll do that. I'll also uh, share with you, if allowed, uh, the intent of the bill as well as some con uh, current concerns. Uh, I think opening the discussion, uh, you know, without going into, in the interest of time, without going into specific details, there are a lot of terms that are flying around. Uh, one is disparities, uh, one is systemic, one is implicit bias, one is explicit bias. There's a term called equity, there's one called equality. So there's a lot of language there. I didn't come to give you all of those definitions. I'm glad to provide some to you at a, at a later time, but I, I think that as we negotiate ourselves, our, our way through this uh, endeavor, I think it's important that we are able to delineate in our discussions the difference between overt racism and ex, uh, or explicit racism and or as opposed to implicit, okay, which is systemic, which is what we're talking about here. There's been a lot of discussions and they feed into one another. For years we've been talking about racial disparities, but at some point or another, we'll need to have the conversation about where, where they come from, racial disparities, okay? So first I'd like to respond to one of the questions that was asked uh, yesterday, which was a very um, poignant question, and I think it, it cuts to the root of everything that we're talking about. There was a committee member, I don't know who it was, but I think it might have been Representative Weed, said, can you give us one example of systemic racism when Coach Christie was on the stand yesterday? Did everyone recall that discussion? <clears throat> and um, he did give a, um, a um, example, and I think that um, the example that he gave was, was a pretty good one. Um, but I think that um, I'd like to say the criminal justice system is a very good example where systemic racism resides. <clears throat> uh, Act, Act 134, 2012, Act 134, um, Racial Disparities in the, criminal and uh, cr in the Criminal Justice System was the title of this legislation, Racial Disparities in the Criminal Justice System. <clears throat> 
And it called our attention to the prison system with 10%, 10% of its population being African American. This legislation called our attention to that six years ago. Okay? Um, while only 1% of the general population of the state uh, is of that particular demographic, a look at what we chose to do about racial disparities in the criminal justice system will not only clearly define systemic racism, but I believe it will also illuminate what are likely some of the only real solutions that we have to address it. The original intent of Act 134 was to, quote, address racial disparities, okay, across the entire criminal justice system. <clears throat> it addressed uh, race in sentencing and incarceration. It also addressed law enforcement, race data collection, fair and impartial policing policy. It addressed implicit bias training, introduced all of these things, by the way, uh, a complaint reporting process, as well as all the other criminal justice system professionals. Okay? What came later was Act 193 in 2014 and Act 147 in 2016, okay? which walked back the scope to encompass law enforcement only and intensified the focus on race data collection, uh, the evolving of the fair and impartial policing policy, and the commitment to um, fair and, uh, implicit bias training. Okay, and that is essentially where we've been since. The uh, Department of Justice and the president of the Chiefs of Police Association publicly acknowledged systemic racism in the criminal justice system during the previous administration. The Department of Justice has implemented the same strategies in addressing systemic racism in educational institutions, law enforcement agencies, cities and towns across the nation, as well as 28,000 law enforcement officers and 5,800 prosecutors in training, okay? We in Vermont, and as well as across the nation, we began the work, the work that's needed to address systemic racism. We've already began this work. Uh, with the tools of data collection, uh, fair and impartial policing policy, as well as implicit bias training. We discovered last year that all 74 agencies are reporting uh, racial disparities in their race data collection. I just want to just contradict uh, slightly what uh, the previous testimony uh, indicated there. All 79 agencies have collected data. The question is, is, where is it? And if anyone around the table knows, feel free to let me know. It's on their crime research group website, buried three clicks down in 79 spreadsheets. But we'll come back to that. <clears throat> All of these 79 agencies are reporting racial disparities in their race uh, collection uh, as uh, directed by Title 20, 2366, uh, and which uh, also mandated fair and impartial policing policy. All agencies have been legislatively mandated to undergo implicit bias training at various levels as well. <clears throat> but if systemic racism is systemic, if it's really systemic, then it must be pervasive throughout all systems. By definition, for the first time in history last year, Act 54 acknowledged systemic racism across all systems of the government to include the criminal justice system. Although the request, which was H-492, was partially, uh, uh, although the request in H-492 uh, was partially uh, which is partially before you in the form of uh, S-281, as well as what you have on the wall there, uh, 868. Um, the, legislature, the legislature asked for more reports and kicked the can down the road on fair and impartial policing policy last year. <clears throat> the report from uh, Act 54 Task Force was released last year. Uh, its story, uh, it's a story um, um, for another uh, testimony, um, but the last report that I'll mention is the, the, that the, the chair and, and the vice chair, who's myself, uh, the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, released a report uh, as well. Uh, it speaks for itself, and it epitomizes systemic racism in the criminal and juvenile justice system, which, which is why we both offered our resignations. <clears throat> Largely, implicit bias is at the root of systemic racism because bias informs decisions, and decisions have, they drive actions and policies which turn, uh, which in turn impact people, okay? 
it would be nice if the whole thing was as simple, but uh, intertwined in all of this is also explicit bias. <clears throat> and while uh, the whole business, because uh, this is a, a really messy dis disentanglement uh, to, to handle, the whole business of explicit bias is handled by our director of the Human Rights Commission. <clears throat> uh, it's my hope that they would be adequately funded and staffed to continue their statutorily mandated work. Obviously, it is um, probably more important now than ever. Uh, moving on to the, to the bill itself, uh, you'll recall as Senator Calamore, as he testified yesterday, uh, he uh, indicated that 12 senators voted uh, for an amendment that uh, would have removed the mandate for people of color to be present on the panel that address that addresses systemic racism. And I, I hope he you know, shed some light on that and why it was important, but I thought it was also important to, to let you know that 11 of those, 11 of those, 11 of those 12, actually voted in favor of Act 54. The 12th one, Senator Brooks, was absent. So history has taught us if systemic racism exists, that it exists everywhere, and that means in all systems, housing, education, employment, health services, access, economic development. The legislative research we provided to you, and I did send over to everyone on this committee a, um, a link that takes you to the legislative research, which is the foundation and premise of this entire piece of legislation. Okay? Um, and I would be happy to resend it if, if there are those who are at the, at the table who have, who have not seen that. The legislative research we provided, um, it, um, it outlines the existence of uh, systemic and overt racism on the statewide and the national, and as well as the global level. Uh, the research, it, uh, it regurgitates the numerous reports, upwards of a dozen, outlining systemic and overt racism in Vermont and beyond. So what is the problem? Uh, national civ civil liberties are uh, rapidly trending downward. Numerous reports, uh, many recent, are providing uh, indicators there. Um, the data continue to indicate a continuation of Vermont's poor, uh, poor performance in providing equity. Uh, the Vermont Human Rights Commission is neither staffed nor funded sufficiently. Uh, we've got to ensure uh, that the, the state immediately takes steps uh, to, to address this. All, all Vermonters, um, uh, should have equal protection and equal opportunity. Um, there must be a state agency with sole responsibility for managing a program to address systemic racism in Vermont. Uh, systemic racism must be acknowledged and addressed as an issue so important that, it, that the approaches should be designed to specifically and purposely address it. And the data, once again, are overwhelming. And the need to collect any additional it seems like analysis paralysis. The original intent of the coalition, uh, the bill, uh, was to Im implement a, um, an independent funded commission to address systemic racism, to address explicit uh, and explicit hotspots. Uh, that means like racial profiling. Um, also, it was also intended to expand the HRC. Uh, add a couple of positions there, uh, separation of roles, uh, predetermination settlements, and so forth. <clears throat> what you see before you in S-281 is, is because of the processes in the Senate, we were unable to meet uh, the, the timeline in getting the complete version of the coalition's iteration of the amendment. And the amendment was refused to be taken up by the Committee on Government Operations in the Senate. It never saw the light of day. When 868 arrived in the House, uh, it first went to judiciary, as you know, and was not taken up at the recommendation of Kevin Coach Christie. And it came to you, and it's, it remains on that board, and the provisions which were buried in the other GovOps remain buried in this GovOps, <coughs> what we were really trying to articulate. We highly encourage you to look at it, to compare it to what it is that we are doing. Could I Madam Chair? You, you made reference to an amendment. Yes. Is the amendment essentially H868? Or what, what is the, the, this amendment that you <clears throat> said was not dealt if, with? If I understand the question correctly, you're asking me, is H68 essentially the amendment? And I, I would say 
No. <laughs> and the reason why I would say that is, is because. A for me. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm getting at it. How about this? Yes. <laughs> so the the. the this is an interesting discussion. So there are two separate, obviously, bodies, so there are two separate versions of the bill that were presented. What made it in the House, what made it in the Senate, was uh, the original bill as proposed by Senator Ingram before any amendment was applied, okay? So the vast majority of H-868 is contained within the amendment that never saw the light of day in the Senate. However, when we placed it uh, into the House, the vast majority of what we were trying to get done was articulated in H-868, okay, with the exception of provisions that are outlined surrounding the HRC. Does that make it clearer than mud? Sort of. <laughs> uh, Should we keep, unpack just, that anymore? Just, just keep, keep okay. going. Fantastic. I'm hoping it'll become clearer as we proceed. Here are our recommendations, Madam Chair. Uh, recommendations from a very high level is explicitly include our education system as a part of the charge, first of all. Expli explicitly in include our education system. Somewhere along the way, it fell off the, the radar. I understand with 794, there's a few other things that are happening that are kind of hokey. Uh, so I have to keep the, an eye on that. But and, and so when you say education system, you mean the pre-K through 12 system out in our I, local community. I mean, starting with the, with the, we have, as I understand, uh, the former secretary, uh, Rebecca Holcomb, step, stepped down last week. So, so we have an, edu an education component within this government. So everything that it touches upon, we should, we should be addressing in this. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, this, that did answer your question? Okay. Uh, ensuring that the, uh, the, the uh, systemic racism mitigation officer, uh, the uh, promulgation authority and the timelines for data uh, collection, uh, policy and training are clear. This is important, a conversation, a, an email exchange with Senator McCormick um, brought this out in a conversation, an hour long conversation with Randy Brock, Senator Brock brought this out as well, is, is that there needs, and it also came out in discussions yesterday, there needs to be crystal clarity in exactly what this position is doing. That doesn't exist yet, okay? And you should be concerned if we move this thing forward in its current state, if you're placing a person out there with independent authority that's funded, and it's not crystal clear, then we're setting ourselves up for a recipe for disaster, okay? Um, that clarity is defined in 868. That clarity is defined in 868. Uh, ensuring that the data collection, policy, training requirements, and timelines are thoroughly communicated. In other words, if this, this entity is going to be establishing policy, training, data collection, and most importantly, an infrastructure that supports data collection for statewide race-based data, because it's not there, okay? And it's not budgeted, it's not funded, and it's not being talked about. But all of this stuff, these timelines and rolling this thing out, uh, they need to be established. If there are, ex are expectations of this position and if there are expectations of the agencies, they need to be very clearly defined in this legislation as we roll it out. They are defined in H-868. <clears throat> Uh, ensure that this, uh, the uh, resource, the uh, systemic uh, racism, I, f I forgot what we even called this guy, the systemic racism um, mitigation officer, uh, and I'm calling it a systemic racism mitigation officer is because I do not want to call it a civil rights officer because it confuses explicit from implicit bias responsibilities. It, it, it really just casts a shadow over everything we're doing because it, look, it looks like out of the gate we don't even know what the hell we're doing here. Okay, and it, it fails to communicate what the, the purpose of this role is, but ensuring that the SRM officer, um, legislative and executive review authority is clear. Now let's just talk just a minute about legislative and executive policy review authority, okay? This, this, this role is not just about data collection. This role is not just about, we envision this role not just also not to be about policy or training. Uh, we also envision this role as, as we said, to be very much about getting to the root of what is creating this system and what is sustaining this system, and that is the development and the sustainment of these policies, okay? 
when something comes out of this committee and before it's voted out in any other committee in this, under this golden dome, when something comes out of our governor's office, we need eyes on that, right? Because if we're creating policies that, that contribute to the perpetuation of systemic racism, what are we doing? So this, this role would have that responsibility, okay? <clears throat> uh, here's some very important uh, quotes uh, of uh, specific recommendations. I agree about the title. We spent a lot of time thinking about it and decided uh, that no matter what we came up with, we would, uh, we would be, uh, it would be undone in the House. Uh, we, so we simply left the word civil rights and we'll let them know we hope they can come up with something better. Senator White, <clears throat> Government Operations Chair. Uh, Mark, could you hang on just one second? Yes. Sec. Jim just had a question in that I'm sorry. In regard. I'm sorry. Well, no, no you yeah, just ahead. step back uh, sure. five seconds. Sure. And you talked about, you know, reviewing legislation. Sure. Um, and, and I'm trying to understand in the context of the bill, did you envision this as sort of a watchdog on what we pass uh, or advance for legislation or a watchdog on us as legislators um, in our own individual actions? The original intent was the former. Uh, however, you bring a very good point. Um, because that is a conversation that we need to have uh, in terms of... I'm, I'm not disagreeing, yeah. but we run into some potential constitutional issues sure. of separation of branches of government and, and who I elects. Completely, I completely um, understand that. I mean, I got unelected. You got unelected? Not, on the news. Uh, so, um, <laughs> it's really nice how you said that. Yeah, another, another it was elected. the news that unelected you? Uh, yeah, well, uh, another legislator got the wrong... <laughs> and sort of put them in my district. So did, that, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, just, I to, so. just to be clear on the, the answer is, is that the, the original intent was, you know, and you watchdog as it may or if you, whatever you want to call it, right. and this, is, this is advisory. Okay, this is not a this is not a veto authority, it's advisory in capacity, but it is a oversight. Uh, and, and oversight is missing in a lot of a lot of what we do to include the the system that we tout okay. where where we've. So I I, I appreciate we get sure. input from all sectors and then some uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know as I look across to Karen, I don't mean to pick on Karen, but um, anybody else is. It, <laughs> um, you know the Human Rights Commission it, um, oftentimes will weigh in on. Um, different issues that, um, so I'm wondering, you know, is this duplicative or is your sense that because um, they don't have a big enough budget, they can't do justice to um, watching some of these issues. And then on, on the other side, we have the Attorney General's office mm -hmm. that have a civil rights division and mm -hmm. they're also letting us know if they think mm -hmm. we're going astray um, right. sometimes. Got it. And, it, and it's all advisory. I mean, Got it. you yeah. know, we get to do what we get to do, <clears throat> and then the sure. courts decide if we overstepped our bounds somewhere. Absolutely, as they should. Yes. <clears throat> and, I, and I think, if I understand your question, is is, is this uh, uh, duplicity, are we creating something that, that, that already exists? Is that well, correct? I, 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 that's part of my okay. question, okay. and could some of this, you know, you, you mentioned earlier about um, budgetary issues mm -hmm. and pressures and, mm -hmm. you know, none of us get to sit down across the hall where some of those decisions are made, mm -hmm. but um, this bill calls for initially a, a part year um, mm -hmm. appropriation, but mm -hmm. then, you know, as it expanded, you know, it's probably going to mm -hmm. be 150, 200,000 or more mm -hmm. down the road mm -hmm. um, annually. Would that money um, be better spent um, expanding the role or, or keeping up the Human Rights Commission, for example. <clears throat> so, first to, to the first part of your question, the um, I understand the overlap, uh, and, we'll, and, I, and part of my testimony does uh, cover the HRC. I understand the overlap of uh, the HRC and the Attorney General's Office on, in many levels. Uh, as it pertains to, uh, pertains to uh, systemic racism mitigation, uh, not just the uh, policy review, uh, or, but all aspects of it. 
it's kind of piecemeal. And, and the best analogy I'll give you is, is as a is, as a uh, as a computer security um, infor uh, chief security officer of a four billion dollar corporation. When I first walked in the door, they asked me. Uh, I asked them who's in, in charge of security, and they said everybody. Um, but at the end of the day, nothing was getting done. Okay, so. Um, once I stepped in that position, there was one <coughs> neck to choke, and there was also somebody who was accountable uh, with a specific responsibility for driving that. It was just that important, mm -hmm. okay? And I think this is far more important than that. Now, to the second part of your question, when we start talking about budgetary, again, it's just that important. How much money has this state spent on <coughs> racial justice in the last whatever? $20,000, period. That was the report that came out of Act 2012. We had the intestinal fortitude to stand up on the other chamber, and we acquired $150,000 for what it is that we're doing now. And I believe we need 10 times that much. And I think it's a crying shame as we talk about systemic racism and what is created in America and where it's come from and how it feeds into poverty and how it fuels wealth in this nation that we're going to sit around this table and talk about money, okay? So I think if we don't have the money, we should find it because it's time. I hope that answers your question, sir. No, I, 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 I appreciate this, you know, um, so your, it's, your sentiment. So I, I think I understand where you're coming from. <clears throat> so here's here's some, a couple of other things and I'll just move on. This is a, the... Uh, I support rigorous examination of institutionalized racism in Vermont state government. I, I, uh, I do think S-281 would be improved by clearer definition of exactly what we are looking for, Senator Dick McCormick. Okay? Um, why would we not you know, explicitly include education as a part of this, uh, ensuring that the, uh, the officer, uh, the promulgation of the authority and the timelines of the data collection and all that stuff articulated more clearly and ensuring that agency and data collection policy training requirements and timelines are thoroughly communicated uh, and that the, um, the, the, officer, uh, the, the officer's responsibility for legislative and executive review are, are clearly articulated. Here's one more. This is, we are fortunate that some data is available to be disaggregated by race. For example, with home ownership, we know that 71% of white households in Vermont own homes whereas 17% of black Vermont households own homes, a rate lower than all but three states. CV, CVOEO supports creating a centralized platform for race-based data collection and overseeing its collection and dissemination, along with other facets of S-281. Kate LaRose, Director, Financial Futures Program, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Development. As a statewide organizer and community liaison of ACLU, I've seen wide support for initiatives for advance, to advance racial justice, but white constituents and people of color, uh, by white constituents and people of color alike, it strikes me that right now is an important moment to take advantage of the energy and the momentum for addressing racism as it manifests in Vermont, Nico Amador, uh, ACLU. Um, and I'll just skip the rest of those. Um, I, I'm skipping over recommendations from Jim Condos and Beth Pierce. Um, they may just come in and testify themselves if necessary. I'll be glad to send those to you um, personally. The committee has some serious work to do, Madam Chair, and some tough questions to answer. Uh, one of the first questions that I propose that you deliberate is this. Do you believe that systemic racism exists? I thought to ask Senator Brock that question in an hour-long discussion, and his response was, although he did, he was not sure that it existed in Vermont state government. I respect him for his transparency and the decency at least to allow me to understand his <coughs> deeply held conviction. If these are the debates that must yet continue in this chamber, then let them continue. <clears throat> But let us not allow the process to be undermined by accepting the notion that this panel that we're trying to put together uh, would be a new breeding ground for debate 
for these types of questions. I implore you, let's have those debates here. Let's not set that panel up for failure. This is the first time in state history uh, that there has been, that we've, di direct, that we've directly addressed systemic racism with uh, legislative action of, uh, of, of any form uh, to, uh, you know, this, this is the first time that we've addressed systemic racism with legislative action. Um, so here, here's a, a couple things I'll just leave you with this. Why is it, if that's the case, if this is such a historic moment, why is it that there's such limited coverage in the media? Why is it that Orca, <coughs> that camera right there, is the only one covering this at my request? Why? Well, the only camera in the room, at least. I hope you're here for the entire thing. Who do you represent? I'm with Digger. Oh, and you are? I'm Xander. OK. Why is it that Digger put out a horrible article last week about the coverage uh, from, from FAR, um, covering uh, you know, the, the debate on whether or not black people should be uh, placed on this panel, as opposed to covering the historic nature of this? And Galloway has my email already. So, so there are issues. I'm glad you're here. You brought something else up. The point is, is that the coverage is poor, and this is historic. Why? Salient as it may seem, there's a couple of clarifying tidbits that I want to ask you on, uh, to share with you on the HRC, okay? I, I'd like to offer, uh, having heard the testimony yesterday, because a couple things just need to be set straight on the testimony that you heard yesterday. First of all, the HRC is an independent organization and does not serve, the director does not serve at the, at the pleasure of the governor, okay? Someone was asking around the table yesterday if other agencies exist. This is one, okay? Secondly, <clears throat> the HRC protects all civil liberties of all protected categories across the state, and I'm sure as Karen Richards comes to testify, she'll tell you the same. And this, is, this responsibility is explicit and overt, um, um, things that in, impinge upon civil liberties that are explicit and overt, okay? Thirdly, the HRC has a responsibility for all constructs uh, with the exception of public employment as well as hate crimes in the state, okay? That's all constructs, okay? And the HRC's um, language, Title IX-141, it mandates that there should be, that there will be a person of color. The statute mandates that there will be a person of color uh, on the HRC, okay? so. This is clarification from what we heard in the testimony yesterday because it was just not necessarily so, okay? Um, and also, just for clarity, um, there has been a, um, a, an African-American serving on this, the HRC uh, up until the time that Coach was appointed, and her name is Dawn Ellis. So that was also incorrect, okay? So that being said, um, I implore you, uh, to um, take a look at 868. And I ask uh, that you would uh, take the responsibility that you have before you uh, in this historic moment in addressing uh, this uh, S-281 uh, with a, a serious gravity. Uh, I, um, I thank you so much for making this a priority. Um, this uh, is, it's very, very clear that this is very important to all of you. Um, and so I know it's a no joke moment for all of you. I thank you for taking S-281 up. And I am open to any questions that you might have. First of all, I do appreciate your passion. Um, for I heard that a lot. Forward. No, uh, <laughs> that passion is good. We all come at things from a different lens. So I appreciate your passion. Um, Background, Justice for All. You said you were a co-founder. Um, <coughs> you type into the computer Justice for All, a variety of organizations come up mm -hmm. in different areas. Is it part of a national group? Uh, is it um, solely 
a Vermont group with no affiliates uh, around the country? It's interplanetary. <laughs> no, actually, um, the, the, the group, it's, it's an interesting story because the, the group was actually started here as a local group. And uh, I woke up, I told you I was a computer security expert. I yeah. woke up in 2014, so I've made myself an expert over the last four years. And it was, as, it was uh, in conjunction with uh, an eighth generation Vermonter that, that this, this, the, the other co-founders, eighth generation white Vermonter. So we are, we are local. Okay, but it, it's not affiliated with any uh, no. national or no. international. And there are others, and I saw, I, saw, I saw those other ones, and, they, they're, yeah. and one is very scary, so I, I appreciate yeah. you clearing that up. Okay. No, no we, we're not against abortion, no. No, no. okay. Well, uh, thank you for um, that, uh, that background. Um, sure. And, and, and just at the end, you talked about historic. Is mm -hmm. it historic um, because this would be the first such um, person set up within state government or commission or board uh, that mm -hmm. uh, and, and earlier the previous witness talked about Maine and I'm not sure um, what exactly they did. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. any comments on that? If your question is directed at what's going on outside of the state, uh, we, we haven't nothing has really come across our radar that, that rises to, to this level but our resources are so limited, and our so our research capacity is is um, is is really not sufficient to really adequately answer that okay. question. Still However, we can look in Vermont. You know, so you may write you know. me down in history Sorry. with your Twitter. Well, oh. <laughs> oh, it was the Google icon. Oh, okay. I was trying to find the main the video. Sorry. <laughs> it was. So the so the the, the answer is is uh, the the historic aspect that I was referring to is is, is the fact that you know here in our state uh, we have yet to take these types of steps. I mean, as much as we've tried just over the last couple of years to move That was for my clarification. Thank right. you. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the committee? John. Uh, Mark, so I've been reading this in 868. Um, and H868 doesn't create a separate panel. No, it doesn't. It, it puts most of the functions in the human. It puts all of the functions in the HRC, right. which, which is where we got blindsided again. Because again, we, we have no ability to deal directly with the, uh, with the legislative council. This was the. Let me just finish that story. Uh, so this this was our there there are time, there are timelines in the House just as you know as there were in the Senate, and this is where the timeline cut off. So uh, Representative Kitz Miller would probably be glad to explain that to you. And I, I think what happened was is that the timeline expired for most of the time as we were able uh, to uh, to add the remainder of our comments. Now there's a seven point. Um, which Representative Kitz Miller is in possession of a seven-point review that we provided to this legislate to this particular bill. I'm glad to provide it to the entire committee. And the, at the top of that list is to remove it from the HRC. Okay. And oh, by the way, when I, as you, what's also not in there is 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 and it, I think it may be in that seven-point list is is that we believe that the HRC should have an additional litigator. We believe that, the, and this is whether this is done or not. If this dies and never makes it out of committee, we still believe that the HRC should have a, another litigator and also an outreach coordinator. And we're appalled why nobody's talking about it this session. Yeah. Okay. Just a quick one. Ooh, you have written testimony there. Did you provide that to us on yes. the committee page? Okay. Yes. I just wanted to know if your testimony was on the committee page. Oh, I will be glad to provide it. I don't think I've submitted it as a Not yet. that one, you don't. Yeah. I'll, I'll be glad to provide that testimony and, and more and more and more. Okay, it's hard to get every bit. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Monica at this point in time? Okay. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. So, committee, I promised you a break at 10. However, uh, I learned the same time you learned that Mr. Thompson uh, expected to testify at 10 o'clock. So if you would like to take the seat, please. And after Mr. Thompson's, if we could take a five-minute break and then um, 
Ms. Wall? Oh, that's great. I was just going to ask because I can't come tomorrow. I, I understand. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I've had two notes on your behalf. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> I so appreciate that. Take, after you. a five minute break. Let's get panel. Little um, maybe, maybe if we could get focused, we've got Mr. Thompson, who was kind enough to let you have a break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He's obviously <laughs> much nicer than I. That's right. You can leave it there. We like whatever you're going to say. <laughs> okay. Check. We don't have Kate Hogan yet. Hmm. No. Okay, so, um, Mr. Thompson, if you would identify yourself for the record, please, and proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, committee. My name is Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general uh, and uh, director of the attorney general's civil rights unit within the office. Um, I don't know many of your committee members. I don't testify. This is my first time testifying before this committee. So I want to give you a little background about myself and about our civil rights unit and some of the things that we do so that some of our comment or some of the comments I'm going to offer today will be viewed in the proper context, I think. Uh, under state law, uh, you, I think you've already heard from prior witnesses, the Attorney General's office has the authority to investigate and enforce uh, uh, Bias-motivated crimes, those are not just race-based, but based upon sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, religion. Uh, we can prosecute those criminally. Uh, we can pursue civil remedies, including injunctions, keep the parties away from each other. Uh, we also have uh, authority to enforce the state's fair employment practices laws for all employers and or all employers and businesses in the state of Vermont, except for the state of Vermont, because by statute, the Attorney General, General's Office is essentially the law, law firm for the state um, to avoid conflicts that, that authority is delegated to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, so we investigate on a daily basis claims of discrimination based upon all protected categories, including race, but certainly not limited to race. We also enforce state leaves law, parental and family leave, we enforce the state drug testing law, uh, military leave law, um, and, and a number of other laws that relate to uh, uh, fair employment practices. Uh, in addition, and this has been especially uh, so in the last year plus, our office uh, with our head appellate unit, our solicitor general is our chief appellate lawyer, uh, we've been involved in um, constitutional litigation nationwide, um, a lot of them relating to things that you've heard about. For example, last week our office uh, submitted with a, a group of states a Supreme Court brief uh, in connection with the so-called travel ban challenge that would be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, next month. Uh, we've been involved in the There have been three separate champ uh, and so far two successful challenges to travel bans uh, that were uh, subject of executive orders by the Trump administration, and we've been challenging those from the very beginning. Uh, yesterday, uh, we uh, joined a, a federal lawsuit in the Southern District of New York challenging proposed inclusion of citizenship questions on the U.S. Census, uh, and um, I and the Solicitor General are counsel of record for the state of Vermont on that. Uh, last fall, actually, it was the day after Labor Day, uh, the Solicitor General and I again became counsel of record in a multi-state challenge to the rescission of the DACA program, uh, which uh, in connection with a California challenge obtained a preliminary injunction. You may recall President Trump said that he would terminate DACA as of March 8th unless it was a crook congressional compromise, but uh, our legal challenge as well as California's separate legal challenge uh, have kept the DACA program in place by court order and that litigation is, is still ongoing. We've also joined in briefs uh, opposing the uh, president's uh, orders uh, regarding uh, transgender members in the military uh, on equal protection grounds. And under the prior attorney general, I and the prior solicitor general filed briefs in both the Defense of Marriage Act and the Marriage Equality cases, which uh, went before the Supreme Court. Uh, we've also joined in briefs supporting affirmative action programs. Uh, that were implemented by the University of Texas. There were two Supreme Court cases where the, cult, the court ultimately um, found, found our, our arguments and other 
The state's argument is meritorious on how to implement an affirmative action program lawfully. I mention all of those legal challenges because many of them involve issues of equal protection under the laws under the 14th Amendment. So that that is a um, that's a field uh, that the Solicitor General General and I spent a lot of time in, uh, and I think. Um, S81, in a lot of senses, really addresses or seeks a, a form of self-examination and, um, uh, and targeted improved performance to provide equal protection under the laws, both in terms of state employment, but also in terms of administration of justice, uh, access to state benefits, and, and so forth. Um, our office, the Attorney General's office, fully supports any efforts by any entity, whether that's a private business, town or a city, the county, or the state to engage in self-examination to find out whether they're complying um, with equal protection, whether they're uh, administering themselves fairly, uh, both in employment and how they, how they do business. So we fully support that. Um, there are many ways to do that, uh, and our office isn't here, and I'm not here really to propose the one best way to do that. Um, uh, I don't I'm not aware of another state that has uh, adopted a model that's proposed in S-281, but that's no comment on the merits of it. It's just that it's, I don't, I'm not aware of another example. Um, what I'd like to talk about today are some of the, because our office, again, is the, the law firm for the state of Vermont, and if this were enacted, uh, the enforcement or the implementation of law would um, would be something that our office may have some involvement in. I want to talk about some of the legal issues presented by the law, and also some areas where I think the committee or the legislature needs to, I think, devote some attention, because I think in looking at this bill in terms of how this would actually operate, I think we see some issues that may come up that you may, may well want to address now, and I think prior witnesses may have already mentioned some of those. So before I dig in, I just want to give you a brief outline of what what those issues are so we know where we're going. Um, first, I'm going to talk about equal protection concerns that are presented by the provisions in this bill to appoint this, um, this advisory panel. Um, second, I'm going to talk about some separation of powers issues that arise in this bill as it relates to the creation of the panel and the appointment and removal powers with respect to this, I think it's referred to as a cabinet level um, civil, chief civil rights officer. Um, I'm then going to talk about some of the legal and privacy issues uh, that are presented by the um, proposed subpoena power uh, for the uh, chief uh, civil rights officer. Related to that, I'm going to talk about the absence of any provision here about the privacy of papers or working papers or uh, exemptions from the Public Records Act for materials that are obtained either by the advisory pit uh, committee or the chief civil rights officer. At least as this bill is currently drafted, they may obtain information that is protected by law from other agencies. <coughs> and then the question becomes, do those materials lose their protection because they're now in possession of a different agency? And that's not really addressed here. Um, uh, I think that there are um, some questions that we would present or we think that should be addressed about um, what it means to obtain race, I think it, the term is race-based data, uh, just to ensure we all know what we're talking about, and talk about some of the uh, issues that may arise there with collecting uh, data, which it, and the types of data isn't, and the sources of the data isn't really specified. Um, and finally, I'll talk about just some practical operational questions that we have uh, that I think are presented by some of the language in the bill which seems rather broad and uh, I think could be subject to different interpretations. So let me start with the equal protection um, issue. Um, this is something I guess I saw referenced in the newspaper articles. I was not involved in any of the Senate testimony or, um, or, or the, the floor votes or discussions of the bill in the Senate. Uh, no one came to us to ask us our view about <coughs> at least as far as I'm aware. Um, but page three um, of the bill, in subsection E2, um, talks about which? E sub two, e two. line three. 
states that at least three members of this advisory panel shall be persons of color. <coughs> I'm sorry. Shall be persons of color. That three of the members shall be persons of color. Um, so that's a, that's three of five members under the under the statute would be persons of color. Um, in constitutional law, that's just called a racial quota. Racial quotas have been um, consistently held to be unconstitutional since 1978. Um, there was a case decided that year called Bakke versus the Regents of the University of California, where the UC, Medical, uh, UC Davis Medical School set aside 16 out of 100 students' slots for racial minorities and a white student who uh, uns unsuccessfully applied for the school, Ronald Bakke, challenged that on equal protection grounds, and he prevailed. Um, since 1978, the Supreme Court has taken roughly a dozen cases involving uh, racial preferences, uh, and over that period of time has kind of sharpened and refined its about when, when race may be taken into account for uh, government action. Uh, and, but one thing that, it, and, and we can talk about that or if you have questions about what the courts found <coughs> permissible, but consistently since 1978, the Supreme Court has said that a plain quota is not permissible. Uh, and that, that was as recent as 2016 in the Fisher case. The Supreme Court reiterated that view. I'm sorry. There was just we were That's fine. Recon confirming that I had seen first Dennis and then Jim question on this constitutionality. Sure. So uh, uh, having lunch with uh, Senator Brock yesterday, he had asked that he could testify for our committee about his amendment and his amendment, which was supported by him and uh, uh, Senator Brooks, uh, did try to remove the, the three of five members mm -hmm. on the board. So I think they were familiar with the uh, constitutional piece, yet it stayed in and his amendment was defeated. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it, there's, a, there's a question. <coughs> so, constitutional. Uh, so, uh, anyway. I, 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 I'm not aware of a case, um, and, and we've just started looking at this, I'm not aware of a case where a, um, a preference is set aside on a state or government panel has been held. Um, we identified two cases, one in 1995, one in 1996, cases out of Florida and Indiana where there was state statutes that said for a seven-member judicial nominating committee that one of the members had to be a minority member. In both cases, uh, an unsuccessful non-minority candidate challenged the law and prevailed. In 2016, there was a legal challenge to a Texas law that held that one out of, well, it may, it may have been more members, actually, several members out of a state, the state bar uh, commission that licenses attorneys would have to be uh, a racial or ethnic minority. And that was legally challenged. And during the course of the, uh, on the same grounds, and before the court issued a ruling, Texas just amended the law to strike that language. Um, so, so the only reason it's, it didn't get removed out of the Senate is because they didn't act. They didn't. I, I'm not sure. No one contacted our office. I did. I haven't even. I haven't read the floor amendment. Uh, I just know that the language is is in the bill, and that's what I wanted to do, to address here. Thank you. Um, it's important that we know that it's unconstitutional. Yeah, Jim. You know, how does this um, compare to provisions that um, colleges may have, for example, in terms of admission? Um, where they might give for a, for a referential treatment, uh, everything else being equal. Sure. So, um, uh, actually, my law school, alma mater, University of Michigan, was the subject. I am a Wolverine indeed. I was about to take them loose Monday night. And they did. I didn't watch. The game. <laughs> I, I, I didn't watch the game. Was there any? I, I didn't watch it. Um, Not much for one. <laughs> anyway, I had nothing to do with that exchange. In 2003, there were two separate challenges to the law school's admission process. They used to have 
a process where if a person belonged to a particular identified group, racial minority, but also could be an ethnic group, were identified, that they were given automatic points and they had a point system. Um, so if you were if you were Asian, you got X number of points, and then at the end of the day, you got points for other things. But um, <clears throat> but that sort of automatic point system was deemed by the court to be unconstitutional. Uh, it had <laughs> at the time of the legal challenge, it had dropped the point system and just said that we'll consider race okay. as part of many other factors, including social disadvantage, whether the person, you know, where the person grew up, where they were, where in some cases, and I. I had classmates like this who were, they were single, and they grew up in single parent homes or raised by their grandparents and basically acted as a parent for their kids. So it was a much more individualized consideration. And uh, race was also part of the factor, but part of the factors that were considered, and in some cases it was considered to be a positive factor, but there wasn't a formula. And the Supreme Court said, yes, you can do that. You can, diversity uh, is, um, is a value that can a state can have interest in diversity to get diverse views. This was in an educational context, so that's a that can be a legitimate government interest. But the Constitution requires that the mechanism has to be narrowly drawn so as to um, to avoid you know just these basic quotas. And so the University of Michigan had a program had a program. The University of Texas in 2016. Had a separate program. Again, it was kind of, I think the court described it as a, a factor of a factor of a factor. So there were lots of issues that were taken, and there were data in those cases showing that there were students who got in, maybe had, they had lower test scores, but they weren't racial minorities. Um, but they had other circumstances that uh, you know added to the diversity of the body. So there are means to achieve diversity, and in fact, the constitutional standard. Uh, before you get to something that looks like a quota, is that there has to be a factual record that other means would not be effective. Um, that would be a little challenging here because this advisory panel has never existed before, so there's no track record. Um, but you basically have to show that encouraging people to, to apply and and um, and con you know considering people if they've had involvement in racial justice that you couldn't get diversity on the board. But the case law is pretty clear. What you can't do is set a number, and then, and then individuals can't compete for those provisions. That's something that uh, the court and I, I in the Fisher case, all of the argument was about whether Texas's admissions program was far away enough from an illegal quota. So I don't think that there was really even an argument about quotas anymore in the court. And I think that's. So I think that's something that has to be addressed here. It can be addressed, um, but either if in in statute or in practice, there's just like this is the minority seat that's that's susceptible to a constitutional challenge. Okay. Um, so those are the equal protection issues. I, I, if there are no questions about that, I'll move on to the other issues. Yeah, point two. So point two really has to do with separation of powers issues. This is. Um, the construct here is, is different than the Human Rights Commission. I believe the governor appoints members of the Human Rights Commission who then appoint the executive director. Uh, in this case, um, there's a creation of a cabinet level provision or position, position in the governor's office, essentially, where the governor uh, has only one vote on the appointment of that individual. And there are obligations here for state agencies to comply with an executive officers who one of their principal duties is to report to the legislature and not the governor. So I think that we, we always look in terms of whether there are laws that uh, intrude upon the executive discretion and having a cabinet level position, essentially, you know, majority involvement are from people that are not answerable to the executive, um, you know, could create a potential a separation of powers issue. Um, and there, there are means to address that, the Human Rights Commission. I've never, I've been in Vermont for 13 years. I've never, we've had cases before the Human Rights Commission. I work with them now. I've never had any issues about uh, their, their impartiality or subject to political, uh, uh, you know, thumbs on the scale, so to speak. So, 
Um, so I don't know why that, that mechanism wouldn't work, but there might be other ones that the committee is <coughs> saying. But what, what's, what's described here, I think, pre presents some, some problems or potential separation of powers problems. Um, Before you leave, yes, no, sure. any questions from the committee on the point number two? Do you understand? Okay. And it would be helpful oh, maybe yes. uh, when, he, when he cites it, he gives us the page or the section or something like you did with the first one there. I'm not sure what's... Oh, sure. Page the, uh, three, uh, it's pages two and three of the bill that deal with the Civil Rights Advisory Panel. And as it's written here, the only person who can remove this cabinet-level position is the panel. The governor can't remove a member of his own cabinet, which um, which it, it is, is novel. I'm not sure we, we've encountered that before. Um, the third issue I wanted to talk about, I'm sorry. So it, with respect to the panel, it, so is the issue the panel to remove the, the chief civil rights officer? The separation of powers issue? Just to so Well, I think I think there are two related issues. Okay. Um, the principal ones are that the panel um, appoints the officer right. uh, and only can remove the officer. Um, and two, the um, the panel has um, some duties that are described in the bill and are entitled to per diem compensation um, without um, without uh, and and I think there are obligations to for other agencies to work with that panel. I think those are kind of second order separation of powers issues. Um, but that you know the I mean when I think about you know, a, a, like a panel and an executive officer, my, my thoughts go to the Human Rights Commission. That's kind of a model that I think doesn't present really separate separation of powers. Um, and um, so, if the panel if the panel was appointed by the governor, would that eliminate the power? Uh, that would that would eliminate that separation of powers issue <laughs> relating to the appointment of the executive. I think so. I don't think that I don't. I'm not aware of any like separation of powers challenge or issues that have come up with the Human Rights Commission. And I think the executive director could probably testify on to that. <coughs> the third area I'd like to talk about, which I think is, is quite significant, is the subpoena power that's given to the um, civil rights officer. Um, this is really, I, I would say, for an unelected official or a non-constitutional off officer, this is a really novel and unusual power to give. The subpoena power, our office has a subpoena power, um, as does the Human Rights Commission and um, certain other um, portions of state government. All of those are in connection with the, either with a statutory mandate to, like the auditor as a constitutional officer can review financial statements. Um, our, our subpoena power is limited to cases where we could show a court, if necessary, evidence of wrongdoing. Uh, we could not, for example, even though we enforce discrimination laws in the private sector, we could not subpoena Best Buy and say, let us take a look at your workplace and see if there's any racial, racial discrimination there. We would have to have evidence going forward, even to have them respond to us to an administrative complaint that there is, that there is already misconduct occurring. Um, there's also a kind of a practical, and, and it's kind of an unanswered question. I'm not really sure how it works operationally. Right now, if the state of Vermont is served with the subpoena, the Attorney General's office represents that, it, that and reviews the subpoena to find out whether it's legally justified, whether it presents privacy concerns, uh, whether it's overbroad and burdensome and might need to be narrowed by, in court. Uh, I'm not really sure what would happen here if the Chief Civil Rights Officer uh, in the statute, who's not an, not necessarily an attorney, subpoenaed, let's say, Fish and Wildlife and wanted to look at their records. The AG's office would review that on behalf of Fish and Wildlife because that's our statutory duty. But I'm not, if there were a dispute about complying, I'm not sure who would represent the civil rights officer. Uh, related to that is that this, the subpoena power is incredibly broad and, uh, and it at least on its face, seems to wipe away any confidentiality uh, provisions, at least potentially. This is on page one, uh, section B. Right, it's under the powers and duties uh, of the um, 
the chief civil rights officer, it says that the cabinet uh, shall provide the chief with access to all relevant records. So one, we don't know what the chief civil rights officer would consider to be relevant records, but theoretically, if he or she were looking at records relating to how the state administers juvenile justice, mental health, um, how it prosecutes cases, there may be all sorts of confidentiality, the Department of Children and Families, that would be protected by state statute. And the question here is whether all access means that, notwithstanding all of those statutory confidentiality, they would, uh, the, the panel, and by extension the chief civil rights officer, would have access to that. Um, I'm not sure whether it overrides the attorney-client privilege. We've got three questions, or three persons asking questions. We've got Rob, then Dennis, and Jim. Thank you. I'm just, in layman's terms here, the uh, <coughs> subpoena powers, what, what, <clears throat> what level does it have to rise up to to be able to be considered okay to subpoena? I mean, like, to get probable cause, or is there other criteria that... As a practical matter, you have probable cause in a court. In some instances, depending on the nature of, you know, what the charge is, it might be a lower level reasonable suspicion. You have to be able to show some evidence. I mean, I think there was actually, many years ago, a question about the scope of the subpoena power for the Attorney General's office in the state Supreme Court was very clear that statutes can't authorize a, 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 anyone to just have a, you know, a fishing expedition sort of thing. You need to have evidence of misconduct. I think here, it's, I think it's fine to have language that would say that, you know, agencies are, that will, they'll work collaboratively and will provide access to records. But it's, it's another thing to say that the executive officer could just put the commissioner of corrections under oath and require them to turn over all records relating to certain offenders. There may be medical information in there, whether people are HIV positive or have mental health issues. I mean, and I think that, I think that would probably draw some opposition from the Department of Corrections. And so I mention it because I think it would be a, a it's, and, and, um, and just structurally, um, I don't think it has to do with the subject matter for civil rights at all, but I think giving anyone that level of subpoena power is, is potentially, uh, could be susceptible to abuse um, if they determine what's relevant and um, what's not. Any other questions on that? So on page six, it talks about subpoena. Yeah, the whole section E, yeah. quite a few places. Um, is there another word that would uh, work instead of subpoena? And if they wanted a subpoena, then they would be requesting, and they would appeal to the Attorney General's office, to your office, to get involved with the subpoena, or would it not happen? So I think there are three questions there, and I think the, I'll take the easiest one. Um, I don't think the statute has any has any mechanism for the attorney general's office to issue a subpoena, and that would make sense because the attorney general's office represents the recipient of a subpoena. So you you'd have a difficult situation where one assistant attorney general is, might con conceivably be in court against another uh, lawyers in the same law firm arguing both sides of the subpoena. So this provides that the officer himself or herself would issue the subpoena. That's the easy question. That the real the underlying question just fundamentally is, do you give this person the right to compel under legal process for people to testify under oath and to produce all relevant records? Uh, typically, and I can tell you now as a practical matter, if uh, state agency one is doing something and that state agency, too, has information relating to that. There's no subpoena involved. It's simply secretary to secretary, tip, typically through the secretary of administration. Um, and I'm not aware of that. It's, it's possible, that, but I'm, I'm not aware of state agency, two, which answers to the governor telling state agency, one, you know, pounce hand. Um, it's just not. So I'm not sure how or why it would be necessary to do that when the responding agencies are all responding to the executive, and if they, if they so if there's there's language here about um, you know working co collaboratively <coughs> and providing data, I think that that's probably sufficient. But I think that the power of a subpoena that's a 
uh, and governments, typically a prosecutor's weapon, and we, we, are, we use it very judiciously and under our statutes and case law, the courts are very narrow uh, or you know, very careful about how you compel people because it, it can be very very costly um, for us to subpoena business. Uh, sort of you know, hits the fire alarm for them. All things have to stop and if the alarm's going, they have to respond to us. It, so it's a very, very powerful tool and it, so it's, I think it can present a lot of problems um, that, that would need to be addressed. Um, we still have two more questions. We've yeah. got Jim sure. and then Jessica, and we're okay. still on uh, the subpoena issue. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to deviate from the subpoena issue, okay. um, if I may. Um, may. Uh, the top of page two uh, in subsection C, it talks, and this is a more of a legal question. That's why I, I That's good. don't want to miss my, uh, miss my chance here. Um, it said that this um, person will reside in the agency of administration and have access to, you know, typical support, but also legal support of the agency of administration. I know the AG's office is a lawyer for the state, so I'm trying to wrap my arms around what does this really mean and where does the conflict exist? Um, for example, um, I'm going to assume, uh, and this, this may be incorrect, but if, let's just say the um, Fish and Wildlife Department has been accused of uh, systemic ra racism, the, the whole department. Um, I assume the AG's office might have some responsibility to defend the department. That, that may be incorrect. So just, just so we can talk, if you don't mind talking my language a little bit, so the laws that we enforce, the Human Rights Commission, don't say that you can enforce racism. It's Racial okay. discrimination. Okay. So you would have to show discrimination either in employment or in the provision of services or, or law enforcement by the uh, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and that would be under existing law, if there were those allegations, that would be under the jurisdiction of the Human Rights Commission. Okay. The department would be represented by an assistant attorney general in responding to the investigation. But so your office, not maybe not you personally, but your office. Yes, yeah. as a division of our office that would represent, would, would represent that's right. the state. Now, if it were an individual <coughs> within a department that was accused of wrongdoing. Okay. Um, who would defend the individual? Uh, it happens to be a state employee. If it if it was someone if the person was accused of discrimination while performing state duties as opposed to something he or she did off duty. Right. Um, there's a state statute that requires the state of Vermont to defend and identify that person. So the attorney general's office would do a preliminary investigation. Okay. To determine whether that person is entitled to representation by the AG's office, uh, and then they would represent that individual as well as the agency. That would likely happen in a lawsuit, like a Section 1983 lawsuit, where our civil division would typically represent the department um, and uh, the individual. If it were the case that a conflict arose between those two defendants, let's say the officer says the agency did it, Agency says this is the op this is not what we do, so right. we shouldn't be responsible. Then there would be a conflict, and there would be uh, private counsel would be provided, typically for the individual. But a state agency would remain represented by the AG's office. Okay, that's helpful. So getting back to the agency of ed, uh, administration <coughs> and access to their legal, does that mean the AG's office? Does that mean? Uh, staff attorney that they may, I don't know what the agency of administration has. Um, there's nothing in the bill here that says the attorney general's office would represent the civil rights officer, but okay. because uh, he's a cabinet level position, uh, it's, it's frankly it's not addressed. It says there'll be legal support uh, of the agency of administration that's not staffed by members of the attorney general's office. The governor has a lawyer. I don't know whether it was contemplated that the governor's counsel, Jay Johnson, would be involved in potential litigation or not. I'm not sure. Uh, if, if the notion is that if there were a conflict and that they would have to hire a law firm, then I think that presents that, I mean, if you leave the, you know, the, um, 
the uh, that the subpoena power in there, then that presents kind of a budgetary issue because um, given the breadth of the subpoena power here, it's conceivable to me that there would be disputes about whether agencies had to turn over materials that are not uh, I'm also concerned of the, the, legal, the lawyer conflict of who do they represent. Um, are they representing the secretary <coughs> officer who's trying to issue the subpoena? Or do they represent the state agency who may have a different view on the subpoena? As I read this bill, the Attorney General's already existing statutory obligation okay. to represent fish and wildlife, let's say, okay. would remain intact. Okay. And my question to the committee or to the legislature is, who would represent the civil rights officer? It's not clear. It's not stated. Okay. I don't think for under conflict, for dealing with legal conflicts, I think it would be very difficult, maybe impossible for the AG's office to litigate both sides of the issue. That's certainly not something you'd want to have happen. We don't do that now. No AG's office does that. Is there another question? Yeah. Yes, we just Sorry. Um, So to go back to the subpoena issue, sure. um, I'm just curious. I understand what you're saying about how this is broad and it would be really difficult to carry out. But if the chief civil rights officer doesn't report to the governor, but he's right. part of the um, cabinet in, <coughs> in a very loose sort of way, mm -hmm. right? He's, part, he's at that same level. Mm -hmm. I get what you're saying, that normally those folks who are at that level, they're all secretaries and then they are involved in wondering about what's going on inside of a department or so forth. It's very easy to talk to each other and say, hey, because we all work for the same guy and hopefully the same guy is putting forward how important this is. Mm -hmm. But if you, if mm -hmm. one of them doesn't, wouldn't it would be, I would think, incredibly difficult to get information possibly from another secretary if they don't both report to the governor and maybe they're, so that's why I think they probably put it in here. And so I'm not sure whether or not you would have a suggestion on a resolve for that. How would you, if you're not, would you think then that the important thing to do would be to have them report to the governor? Or is there another way to resolve that conflict? I think what's the way it's set up now, I mean, you have identified two issues which kind of, um, they kind of multiply the potential for conflict. One is that you have an official who may operate out with one foot outside of the executive's control. That's the separation of powers issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then second, uh, that individual would have the authority to subpoena all of the other agencies of state government with nothing in there about confidentiality or a sense of what constitutes relevance. So I think that the rest of that would, you know, it depends what, how that authority is exercised. It may not be there may not be subpoenas flying out on the first day of work, so right. to speak. Right. It would depend um, on the two folks, well, who the governor is, what kind of person, what his thoughts are, and who the chief civil rights officer is. But I think, I so think if we, there were a legal challenge, let's say, for example, that <coughs> the, one of the areas for examination is um, how justice is, is meted out uh, in connection with the Department of Children and Families. And let's suppose that the chief civil rights officer says, one way we can do our audit is that you give us all of your case files, the ones that have the juvenile's names, have the names of their parents, if their parents are addicted to, uh, to drugs or, or alcohol, all of that information would be in there. I would imagine that there would be an opposition to that with DCF saying, these are all protected by a big stack of statutes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's conceivable that the civil rights officer would say, my law says that I, I can access all relevant records, and I think this is relevant. I think they would, if they couldn't reach agreement on that, then I think that would probably be presented in court. I think part of the legal challenge to the subpoena would be that it was issued by an officer uh, who's, that maybe the subpoena power is not constitutional because it violates separation of powers. Uh, and then a judge would have to resolve whether the language here about access to all relevant records trumps the language, the other language in the statute that protects the confidentiality of juveniles and, and family matters. I mean, that, that's just one example. It could be pre-sentence reports. It could be administration of mental health. Uh, there are just so many laws that we have that protect information about individuals who come to the state for services or who are in the care of the state, either in correctional custody 
or, or foster care and so forth. Um, and this bill just says all relevant records and uh, the fact that that comes from someone who has kind of one foot in the legislative sphere, uh, maybe a toe in the judicial sphere, because the Chief Justice appoints one of the members of the panel who, who might have, who could have a deciding vote on whether to remove the Chief, uh, the chief Civil Rights Officer. I think that's, yeah, those are all, those are interrelated problems, and I think they are problems. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Any other questions on some <coughs> Point number four. Point number four that I think is very simple, um, which is that there's no provision for confidentiality for all of these records. So the Public Records Act has many exemptions, uh, and those apply to records that are in an agency's control. Uh, and the question, if there's information that's shared, and there are exemptions, so we could share investigation from one of our investigations, for example, with law enforcement. So if we and state police were looking at a hate crime, or something that comes to us as sexual harassment, but we think it's sexual assault, we could share information with the state police. Well, let's imagine, for example, that the uh, chief civil rights officer gets information uh, because, <coughs> through some mechanism, if not a subpoena, some other mechanism. The question then becomes whether, you know, whether to what extent that information could be subject to a public records request. <coughs> Are the working papers uh, subject to the public records request are, you know, the data might come in a way that's not de-identified or aggregated. It might have inform So it's just not addressed at all. And we think that it, it ought to be if, um, and then the quite and there's no, uh, at least stated here, there's no confidentiality obligation for the panel or the, the we, we have a very strict confidentiality rule as of the Human Rights Commission about materials that they receive during the course of an investigation, materials received by subpoena, subpoena or testimony, or just information. Um, and there's no, there's no privacy issue here. Um, so that, I think that's a simple one. Um, I guess point the next, five. yeah, point five, um, and I, I can't recall if I, it was point five or point six. There is information, there's, um, uh, this is on page five of the bill that talks about, uh, in section two on that page, which says that one of the duties um, of the chief civil rights officer is to manage and oversee the statewide collection of race-based data uh, to determine the nature and scope of racial discrimination. We, uh, I will say that we like the word discrimination because we have a lot of case law on what discrimination means. We don't have much case law on what racism means if, it, if it's any different. Um, but the question is, what, what is that statewide information about race data? I mean, sometimes someone's race is, or your, their belief race, perceived race, is pretty easy to discern, and sometimes <laughs> um, And who's collecting the information? Are individuals who contact the state government now going to have to identify their race each time? Sometimes that's done on a voluntary basis. But the collection of racial, of, of data dealing with someone's membership in a protected category is a very sensitive issue. Um, last year, the House voted and, and passed S-79, which prohibited the collection of information relating to religion. Um, there were concerns last year, whether founded or not, but there were concerns about the creation of a Muslim registry or the federal government trying to create a registry of Americans. And so the collection of data, the census case, the citizenship data that's being collected. So I think, uh, it's, un, it's an unknown to us what that collection of data is. I think it's unusual to just say these, this panel and the officer decides what the data is in advance. Typically, you would want to have the legislature and the governor and the creation decide what, what sorts of data um, you would want to collect and, um, and how that, that information would be stored and what might be prohibited uses uh, of the data. Um, because it might be that one agency knows that there's a lot of racial data out there and might be interested in having it for some purpose. And that, that might be a problem. You might be very concerned by that. But there would be, there's nothing here that would prohibit that. So it's kind of a big black box or question mark for us. <clears throat> was that a bill or was that a resolution? Which one? The one that was collecting the data. It's a, it's a law, Act 5. It was passed last year by the House and Senate dealing with. Uh, well, I know we did a resolution too. Okay, no, the, the one I'm talking about is is a, is a statute. 
have to yeah, we, we we refer to it loosely as the, the no registry bill. Um, so so that's that. There were some questions about what racial data is collected uh, and how and how it's managed. That that's not addressed, and that's kind of a that's a big issue. I think members of the public, um, uh, you know, I think may have an interest in, in that as well as state employees about how you collect that data or what you do with it. The final point just has to do with. I think operational issues that are presented by the broad language of the bill. Um, I think I heard part of the testimony before me saying that there should be more specific targets or priorities set forth in the bill. Um, I think both in terms of a policy matter, but just an operational manager in terms of uh, government accountability and meeting <coughs> expectations. That's that's desirable. I think there are lots of things here that we don't. <coughs> Our office, if it were to come in, it doesn't really, we're not sure what certain things mean. Like it, there are provisions here that's, that says that, that say um, that, um, I'll give you one example. I won't give you all of them. I'll just give you one example I think is representative. Uh, on page four, um, it's the last three lines of page four that refer to is this is the first duty of the civil rights officer that say that the officer shall work with the agencies uh, to implement a program of continuing coordination and improvement of activities in state government. Um, I'll just leave it right there. It, I don't know exactly what that means. We could imagine, because we live in the conflict world, right? We deal with conflict all the time. If they're talking, let's say they're looking at corrections about issues and the Department of Corrections says, okay, we've talked with you, we understand your point of view, and we disagree. Is there a still a, so do you, are you still obligated to work with someone that you just said, we agreed up on what we can agree, um, and you're going to be around for the next four years, and that topic is, we're going to still work on that, I'm, I'm, or to implement a program of continuing coordination, I mean, I don't really know what that means. It, it, I think it's, I, well, we can anticipate the Attorney General's office is a state agency saying, so what, what is a program of continuing coordination? Are we supposed to have employees that are set aside to be liaisons to the office to respond to information requests? Are they supposed to come up with recommendations? I, and I'm not sure how we would answer that. It's, it's, it's just very broad. Um, I understand the notion, the, kind of the goal of collaboration and cooperation and working on the same side of the table. But in terms of a statute um, to like set forth duties for a new um, state employee and, and office and to have, put obligations on other agencies, it's, it's probably not specific enough. Uh, and I think that could be a recipe for, for a conflict and dispute that should be avoided. Um, so those are, the, those are the areas that we would talk about. Again, um, we think it's great uh, to be talking about or to be focused on doing something that has self-examination about discrimination, either in employment or provision of benefits or administration of justice. Um, but the, the bill, at least in its form right now, presents these issues that we thought you should, you should be aware of. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions, Mr. Thompson, from ACD? Thank you. Thank you. Very illuminating. Um, Diana, please go. Diana, you're with the Community Equity Collaborative. My name is Diana Wally, and I'm the convener of the Community Equity Collaborative of Southeastern Vermont. Maybe I could begin by describing our collaborative. I, I included, oh, let me hear. <coughs> I do have copies for you of my testimony. Okay. And was it southeastern or southwestern? Southeastern, southeastern. Tristan's, Tristan's mm -hmm. area. I included with my testimony a, a longer detailed description of our collaborative. Um, because I just think it's, um, we're coming to you as a community rather than with a special skill. 
And um, we were founded after the quite serious race hate incidents that took place in our high school in Brattleboro and um, in our transportation, in 2000, uh, transportation center in 2008. These might ring a bell. They were serious enough that uh, the community convened, and it was like a tipping point. Uh, people had numerous community meetings and discussions and um, really saw this as a time to look at for meaningful and long-term ways to respond to those kinds of incidents. The first thing that we did as a group, and uh, Curtis was one of our founding members and helped to lead uh, the organization of a future search conference which engaged uh, 80 people in our community that represented a cross-section of the community, youth and adults, all sectors, economically and, and community leadership. And we spent three days together uh, considering what had happened, considering similar events that had happened in our community in the past. Um, and by the end of the three days had arrived at a four distinct actions that we felt would really make a difference for the future. And that's when our collaborative formed. We um, are the, um, the stewards of those four actions. And what they are, are uh, first of all, anti-bias law enforcement education, social competency development in our public schools, and, and that is my work, my work life. This is our collaborative is a voluntary entity, um, but in my work life, I have worked with the Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union for the past 10 years to develop this social competency development curriculum, which is a parallel to the academic curriculum. Um, and the, uh, its, its intent is to create positive relationships and inclusive schools, welcoming schools. The third action is a Celebrate Diversity Day that happens in our community every single year that is community-wide and is positive and is fun and engaging. And the last is uh, the Vermont Vision for a Multicultural Future Statewide Conference, which Curtis uh, <coughs> and the Vermont Partnership administratively run, but our collaborative sees it as our responsibility to galvanize participation. And um, now that's going into its seventh year. 20% of the students in our public schools identify as students of color. And we think that um, that's an inspiration to us to be proactive. If you look at our census, Maybe we're talking 5% of our southeastern Vermont population are citizens of color or community members of color. But we can see that we're evolving and we want to um, create a community that is free of prejudice and discrimination. And our, our membership is a cross-section of community leadership. It's very inspiring to be at our meetings. So this is, uh, we highly endorse S-281. We have testified. Um, three times during the Senate meetings. And this is just a, a summary of ways that we feel this bill could be improved or expanded. So the first is, um, we don't think um, it's necessarily an assumption that everybody reading this bill knows what these terms are about. And when we're talking about institutional racism that they understand or perhaps there's a variety of ways that they would come at that term. And we thought it might be a good idea to include a definition. I know there are some bills that start off with a definition. So we put forth what we think is an example. Um, you might arrive at a better, clearer definition, but the one that, that we have composed here is institutional attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that inform policies and practices that privilege the dominant racial and linguistic group, which includes white people and people for whom English is their first language. So this is an example, but perhaps you will find something that would be clearer. But we just recommend that people are on the same page when they're then proceeding with um, working with the bill. 
Regarding the advisory panel, we did, um, and we, I learned a lot from Mr. Thompson's uh, testimony here, uh, we did agree with the majority uh, appointments being people of color, but that might be questionable. When looking at the position itself, um, I know from sitting in the Senate uh, discussions that um, there was a concern that the appointment um, by the governor, um, if that's the way that it was established, that there might be political, that, that the position might become politicized and therefore every succeeding administration might say, no, we want this guy in there or, or we want this woman in there. And, and there would be a lot of shifting back and forth that would water down um, the meaning and the, and the power of the position. So I, I just from witnessing the going back and forth, I think that that's what their point was about keeping it independent. Just as Curtis recommended, we also questioned the title, Civil Rights, for the same reasons. Uh, that seemed more individually oriented. Mitigation is one idea. We also thought maybe equity would be another title, but uh, perhaps you'll, you'll have through other testimony better recommendations. So um, one thing, and this is from our original <coughs> experience that we have had that we wanted to share, and we, we felt that it might be informative to you in the way that you think about the support for this position. So in other work settings, I think that there certainly have been chief diversity officers that have been appointed in a variety of settings, whether they be um, you know, private <coughs> work settings or in, in public settings. In um, the School for International Training, in, in the graduate school in, in Brattleboro, um, over a number of years, there's been a lot of conflict between the administration and the students about the need for diversity education and, and improving the way the school was run. Last year, they took the bull by the horn and they hired a chief diversity officer, uh, Michelle Cromwell. She's highly skilled and um, came with um, an abundance of experience in thinking about educational settings and the needs. And within four months, she resigned. Uh, the reason was that the school itself and its administration had not really thought ahead about what type of support she needed to move forward. They hadn't really um, given thought to having an individual coming in and, and giving them these recommendations, what they were facing in terms of changing their own um, ways of doing their work. So I hand this just as an example um, and my our question that we pose is, how do we ensure that this officer has the necessary power within various severe spheres of influence in state government? How to make sure that we have the officers back? And in advance, for instance, where their office is um, situated? What type of an environment are they in? And is, there, is it a welcoming, um, is, is there a team spirit to the work setting? So um, enough on that. Um, this work dovetails with the state's mandate for results-based accountability, and I think that's part of its power. It's, uh, it's very encouraging to see the possibility for close collaboration with the chief performance officer, Sue Zeller, and each state agency and department. So the, the task is to develop performance targets and performance measures. Um, I, in the last two pages of my testimony, I provided some examples. Having worked as a trainer with results-based accountability around the, the state, it was inspiring to me to think about uh, ways that this effort can be accountable. So what you will see um, on the back two pages are, first of all, uh, Racial Equity in Act 186, the conditions for well-being for all Vermonters measuring population well-being. So seeing how this work dovetails with the outcomes that are embedded in our, in our work statewide. 
Um, and I just am including, and when you're thinking of what are we going to measure, I included some examples that just pop out for me. Um, you have a full list of some examples I've, I've um, listed, but uh, for example, Vermont has a prosperous economy. The percent of business owners who are people of color, the percent of homeowners that are people of color, so that, that relates to Mark's testimony, this 17% um, versus 77% was um, very enlightening to me. Um, and then going into my realm of work um, within the public schools, children succeed in school. The percent of children of color who drop out of school. And I really learned a lot um, when I was, or, um, a red flag went up when um, Mr. Thompson was doing his, his uh, critique just now because I myself, with our, within our own school district, have had a hard time creating year-to-year -year data um, comparisons since we don't have a high population of students of color of the dropout rate. Um, and it's, I, some administrators feel that they really need to protect that information. So it, just one small example from my corner of the world. Then thinking, okay, in our service systems, we see these population indicators that we're interested in tracking. Um, how do they relate when we're measuring performance and the well-being of clients? And um, it, it's, it's heartening to me that in Sue Zeller's work as chief performance officer, that um, she has appointed a liaison in each agency, each department that um, is working on performance accountability, I can see that that team of liaisons being a really supportive uh, work team with this new officer. And um, so again, I'll use it an example drawn from the, uh, the indicator that I referred to about the percent of business owners who are people of color. If we look in the service system for economic development, one performance measure could be, is there entrepreneur development education that engages effectively people of color? So one example. Another one regarding um, education, again, if we're thinking about why do students drop out? Are they, do they feel welcome in their school? Uh, a performance measure could be social competency development education is established as parallel to academic achievement in all public schools. And then thinking about graduation or summer or, or after school experiences, are, do programs exist to help youth of color gain connections to the larger community where they see themselves as having a valuable role? So these are all very measurable um, work. I, I appreciate having a connection with Drew Russell the AHS performance officer uh, and um, in looking this over and just critiquing it before I prepared it for my testimony. So the next piece of what I wanted to share um, is regarding this review, what is called an assessment, a review that is a first task that the officer will do um, and perhaps uh, be hiring a team of consultants to complete. Um, our collaborative really thought about that, and um, not just as an, something that happens, you get a report, and then you start doing your work. But let me just read how we define it. We see this inventory as a power analysis of state government, focusing on institutional racism. The depth of the inquiry relates to the quality of the outcome. Key areas of inquiry will include the whole spectrum, recruitment, hiring, retention, workplace culture, and client advocacy. The needs assessment is a building block in a long-term strategy. It is the beginning of racial disparities education where the focus is on relationship building. So again, I want to reinforce what Curtis's testimony was so strong with about this is an asset building opportunity. We need to be aware that by unveiling what has not worked, this inventory is excavating people's worst fears. We're asking participants to name how privilege is operating in their work setting. 
A carefully crafted design will result in honest feedback. The hope is to use methods promoting effective conversations, perhaps through focus groups, that the civil rights officer can use as a guide. A multitude of disparities will be identified in this process. So, um, of course, the hope is to reinforce the best practice, as Curtis testified, but uh, there will be a multitude of disparities that will be unveiled, and the hope is that that can be done in a productive uh, relationship building manner. My final piece has to do with the training curriculum, and our collaborative has been working uh, for the past eight months or so, ever since the last Vermont Vision for a Multicultural Future conference, where uh, representatives Morris, Gonzalez, and Senator Ballant uh, joined in with me and with other members of the collaborative to think about their hope for having legislative, legislative education on these topics of racial disparities, implicit bias, how to make something like that happen annually. We have been meeting recently with the Snelling Center on that effort. So in that process, we've thought, what are we talking about here? And it, it, we felt quite clear that this was not a check off, one workshop kind of a deal. But instead, what we're sharing with you here are three different areas of curriculum content that we feel over time could be covered um, with the training plan that the officer develops after the review is completed. And so the first of those would be understanding, it would be at a personal level, understanding our own social identity. The second would be understanding institutional and structural racism in Vermont and nationally. And the third is understanding those intersections. And in our conversations with Senator Ash and with Representative Johnson, um, they both brought up that intersectionality that's important uh, related to other populations, issues such as socioeconomic, etc. So uh, this is uh, these are the key areas that we feel you should consider, and we really um, feel it was an honor to be part of your work on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very thorough look at the issue. Now, questions, John. So, Diana, based on your testimony, I, I take it that you don't think that the, the chief civil rights officer should be set off in this sort of stovepipe of independence. We have a concern about that, although we understood the Senate's wish that this not be a political appointee position that could waver. Uh, we know that this is a long effort. I, I think we put in the beginning of our testimony, we can imagine this being a 10-year effort, knowing the work in our region has taken that long. Um, and so to waver back and forth with appointments is a danger, but the answer is yes, we're worried that there be an isolated Right, and therefore be ineffective in yeah. collaborating with various state agencies and getting some of this important work done. Yeah. And so I, I did like your idea of, of coordination between this position and the, the chief performance officer in the state. Right. That, that's, a, that's an intriguing thing that's not really right. spelled out currently in the bill. Yes. Um, but would be a way to you know, implement this in a proactive sort of way rather than reacting um, yes. to what may or may not be going on in state government with respect to this systemic as, as long as the resources are there for Sue Zeller to feel, oh my gosh, I'm just being landed with something that's massive to deal with in addition to what I'm already doing. As long as the resources are there to support the <coughs> work as a team. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? No. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Long 
Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Beth Fastigi. I'm the Commissioner of Human Resources. And um, I'm going to turn my notes over. <laughs> I think some of you have been getting to know me over the course of, uh, <laughs> over the course of this legislative session. Um, I have a background in the private sector. I spent 30 years in the private sector. One of the companies I've worked most recently as the state president of Fairpoint Communications, and I've been in this position almost a year. So I feel like I've gotten my feet wet in state government, and um, it's, it's, it's been a really very interesting um, concept. Uh, just <laughs> um, a part of that, one of the companies I worked for was Verizon, and Verizon had a very extensive um, background um, company initiative around diversity. We had supplier diversity programs, employee diversity programs, um, customer diversity programs, um, our philanthropic efforts, efforts focused on um, diversity organizations in many cases, um, also marketing efforts. So it was kind of a long tradition of working for that company in a culture that really embraced diversity. It was really considered a business imperative. And it really came from the top down and it was really woven into all the values that we, that we did as a company. Um, just wanted to give you that a little bit of a background. Um, and thank you guys for having given me the opportunity to testify with respect to this bill and the administration's view on this bill. Um, from what I understand, the evolution of this bill has um, in part come out of um, what was passed last year in Act 54 and some of the report outs and the findings, or I don't know if you call them findings, but the report on um, systemic racism in Vermont. And um, as the report documents, there really um, implicit racial bias does exist in the state and it also pers persists in all areas of Vermont that were investigated by the Attorney General's Office and the Human Rights Commission. So if you haven't read that report, I really encourage you to do so. There's also an executive summary um, that's, um, that's shorter. <laughs> uh, and I know you're going to be getting a lot of other information to read today. Um, and I think the persistence of this implicit bias manifests as systemic racism, and it prevents true equality of opportunity for all of these realms um, in housing, in public education, and employment throughout our society and culture. We are the largest employer in the state of Vermont. Uh, um, there's some UVM healthcare may be expanding and be a little higher than us right now, but as a, one of the state's larger employer, um, we would not be immune to the effects of systemic racism. Um, and it really, state government, um, and insofar as that um, S-281 acknowledges the existence of this problem, that really does represent a laudable step by the legis legislature towards moving, in moving towards eradicating it. So I think um, kind of building on what um, Mr. Hughes was saying earlier, that um, that's, that's what he was saying was um, laudable, the fact that the Senate recognized that and wanted to do something about it. Um, the Department of Human Resources, as well as the administration, um, thoroughly support and share the goal of this legislation um, to eradicate systemic racism across and throughout state government, both in employment, workplace practices, and in the provision of many of the services that we provide, um, from the issuance of um, providing driver's licenses and vehicle registrations at the DMV, um, to reviewing, processing, and auditing tax returns, um, and again, to protecting the state's most vulnerable and at-risk citizens through the Department of Children and Families. Um, S-281 creates a new high-level position in state government, the Chief Civil Rights Officer, perhaps the Chief Mitigation Officer, which I also liked that title. Um, also creates an advisory panel charged with the duty to hire and endow with the exclusive power to remove the Chief Civil Rights Officer. Um, and again, the department believes that the goal of this bill to work toward and attain um, the eradication of systemic racism could be achieved without um, this particular construct. Um, to, 
to really work toward this, what's required is leadership from the highest office and the highest levels in state government. So you really do need the governor, the secretaries, the department commissioners, plus the division heads and directors, really to buy in to a cultural change and work toward it and work toward that with enthusiasm. And if there's not enthusiasm for that, that enthusiasm needs to be driven from the top down. Um, and, and I don't think that it's gonna be easy to do, but I also think that the construct that's set up with an advisory panel that's hiring a person that will be embedded in an organization that has not been chosen by the chief executive of the organization is setting um, that person up in the office up for failure, as um, Ms. Wally was, was saying, and it's also not the best construct for effective change and making that happen and, and feeling like everybody's working towards the same mission. Um, if you have to go to, if you have to get a subpoena to compel somebody to provide the right information or to work towards getting information that's gonna help us toward this mission, it's totally gone in the wrong direction. And um, we have, we already have the Human Rights Commission that's, that hand, that, that investigates and provides opinions on explicit racism and in our, in our, in, as an employer, they, they already do that and they're already doing that work and um, no offense to Karen, but I really wouldn't want, <laughs> I really wouldn't want her, uh, you know, just saying, hey, you have to show me this, you have to show me this, you have to show me this all the time and just coming into work in our office because at times, even though we support the work of each other and we're um, on the same committee, which is the, the same council, which is the Governor's Workforce Act and Diversity Council, we work pretty closely on that, on shared goals and how we can work to improve things. Um, there are times when we're in adversarial positions and then also might work together on a compromise to do training um, and help train employees and we've had some great successes in that. But um, I don't think in, in that position I would want the Human Rights Commission sitting in the same office as the Secretary of Administration. I think that would be counterproductive. Um, and that's almost the type of situation you've set, has been set up but haven't, haven't um, put this chief civil rights officer in with that panel. So if you had a whole construct that could support it like they do at the Human Rights Commission, that might work. Um, having one person, it's a large task doing that work, kind of embedded but not really supported, fully supported, it is, 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 is unworkable from my perspective. Um, If it's the intent of the legislation to set up an advisory panel, that advisory panel would be able to do that, just that, provide advice to the governor, to agency secretaries, also to other branches of government. Um, and we welcome advice from, from people, but a, a formal panel to provide advice um, seems like that is very workable, some kind of construct around that would, would be fine. Um, but a new but a new person with this task and if that is the direction the bill goes in, it would be best to have that person reporting directly for the governor. The, also the panel could potentially advise, um, you know, present candidates to the governor for selection, um, and it would be very helpful to have a panel as named in this um, organization provide, help provide candidates for this position, um, but as opposed to the ability to remove that person and the ability to hire that person um, in, the, in the organizational dynamic, and if you want to create cultural change, really should be um, accountable to the governor and the administration. Ready for some questions?
Um, I just wanted to talk about, I know people have talked about some of the tools and resources and um, good efforts that are already happening in state government. So what I'm just going to do is list them. I think you're going to be hearing from a lot of folks um, that have talking about that. Um, but to step back, we do have a state EEO plan that we do every year that comes out of the um, Human Resources Department, and I can share that to you. There are some statistics in there that talk about um, a percentage of minority and women hires, how we're doing on recruiting, um, how we're doing on retention of those employees, the progress over time, so that is all in the report. It does demonstrate we're making um, some progress, maybe not as quickly as we would like, but in those areas there, is, there has been steady improvement shown over the past several years. Um, we also have our workforce report, which I'm not sure if I've talked about in this committee or not, but it has a lot of great statistics about our employees and our workforce in here. So if you don't have it, it's available online. You might not want to um, need to print the whole thing out um, in the minds of saving paper, but it's a very good report. It has a lot of statistics and it would be a good starting point for um, data collection of this position. Um, uh, also, Ms. Wally Robert, mentioned the um, Chief Performance Officer, Sue Zeller. I want to point out that person is also um, accountable to the governor and, and is embedded within the administration, has survived um, several administrations, and um, is a highly valued and respected member of, um, of leadership in state government. And I envision this position could also have just that same um, level of um, authority and respect and um, ability to affect change as, um, as the Chief Performance Officer has. So I really appreciate um, your comments in that, in that area. Um, um, we have really good examples from various agencies. Um, you're going to be hearing from um, the state police on their fair and partial policing, also from the Civil Rights Office, from the Agency of Transportation. Those are some really good bright spots and um, examples that we take and we look to to see how we can do that in other agencies. So those are some of the ongoing efforts that we're doing and learning from different agencies and seeing where we can use what they've done across state government. We have the Center for Achievement in Public Service, which is our statewide training center. Um, through that, we have online and classroom training. Um, we offer training both diversity and cultural competence. We are also um, developing training and implicit bias as we speak. Um, we uh, diversity and cultural competency training is mandatory for all supervisors in state governments, um, and we're also even though it's not um, relative this um, to um, to sy systemic racism, I just want to highlight the efforts that we're doing with um, our course on preventing and addressing sexual harassment in the workforce where we're training all employees in state government on this issue. Um, we've already trained the cabinet and the extended cabinet, and um, by the end of the year, we'll have all of our employees trained. It's a massive effort, um, and it's really, uh, from what I know, one of the first times that we're doing a training that is going to be done across all state government, all state agencies. Usually a lot of training, especially, uh, a lot of training is really um, up to the individual agency, and it's really time to make sure that all employees at all levels really understand um, what the policies are, what their rights are, how they can how they can make a complaint, how they feel protected. Also, it lets supervisors and leaders understand that they're responsible. And not only does that um, go towards sexual harassment, but it's also the same type of procedures you would go to if you were going to try to report a discrimination complaint or any type, so any type of complaint. So employees, even, even though it's a different training, they are um, being educated on how to, um, where to go if you experience a problem and who, what your, their resources are and how that the state will, will investigate and will work to um, protect those employees. Um, our state strategic plan, we have a strategic plan. Um, the agency administration has goals on those plans um, along the lines of employee recruitment and retention and changing the culture towards that. Um, it's my job to implement that part of our plan, um, including um, as far as our recruitment efforts, we're actually just signed the contract with um, our vendor to get some new recruitment software. 
that's going to be able to provide us with much better statistics on um, minority applicants and when they might be dropping out of the recruitment process. So it has a much better ability than we currently have to look at that data once we get that in place. It also has um, the ability to look at job descriptions and to look at bias in job descriptions and call those out so we can change job descriptions before we get up also. So that I just wanted to point out those are some of the few of the efforts that are going along. Also, um, I briefly mentioned it, but the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council is made up of appointees from different um, agencies, including the Human Rights Commission, the Women's Commission, um, members of the public, so it's a 15 member, um, up to, well, I think it's up to 15 members that can be um, on that uh, council, and that the purpose of that council is, is to provide advice and um, advice and um, and I guess it's just pretty much advice <laughs> for whatever we want for um, the Commissioner of Human Resources and the Secretary of the Agency of Administration on equal employment issues. And there's been a lot of good work um, <coughs> in the past, and um, I'm excited for um, the work that they're continuing to do. Now that's, I think that is it. So we have questions for you. Thank you. We have questions from Dennis and Jim. So you were in the room when the, the Assistant Attorney General was talking about the six issues. And uh, he mentioned about uh, it would put the, uh, an obligation to work with the panel on to the state. He also talked about uh, no provision for confidentiality, which uh, I would think, uh, you know, you have concerns with that, and also the collection of data and managing data and stuff. So I mean that puts you in a in a position where you you know I understand that you're working together, and I'm sure you would anyway. But uh, uh, those are three areas that I would think. Uh, yeah, I fully support um, the attorney generals. Um, all six of their points and calling those out as all all issues and. Um, he definitely um, spoke much more eloquently than I can about them from a legal perspective. Um, from a legal perspective, there it's, I think the setup is problematic, but also I'm from a, of an organizational perspective and the ability to affect cultural change is problematic as well. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's really, it is, it is a major task to work to um, eradicate systemic racism and um, it needs full buy full buy-in from leadership, like has happened, uh, like the changes that we've seen in the um, in the Department of Public Safety over the past several years. It has had full buy-in of leadership over the time, and that's um, transcended beyond commissioners. And the pe you have to remember that the people who are actually doing the work are classified state employees that are. Um, <coughs> You know, once they're behind the mission, it's it's very difficult to change it. So um, you know, get those very high-level leaders in state government that um, are not appointed, working towards this mission and embracing it. Um, change will will continue, and um, you know, over time it becomes organic. Organic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Beth, um, I'm, I'm a little confused by some yes. of your earlier remarks on some of the issues and then some of the details on the bill, but um, the legislative intent says um, creating a culture of inclusiveness. So I, I think that presupposes we don't have a culture of inclusiveness in state government. Would you agree with that statement? I, I agree that we want to create a culture of inclusiveness in state government. I would say that cultural inclusiveness is something that we're actually working at in our onboarding initiative. We have a um, part of our strategic goals. We're actually looking at um, employees when they start um, to, for the first six months and how they're welcomed into state government. Um, 
the workforce, the available workforce is dwindling as our population is decreasing and as we age. And it's, it can be a challenge to attract employees. The ones that we attract, we want to keep. We don't want to lose them to the private sector. And if they're not coming into an environment that's challenging and welcoming, um, they will leave. And so I think it's really from the individual perspective. I think the people who are staying in their jobs may think it's welcoming, but the people um, who are leaving uh, may not think it's particularly welcoming. And when you also look at statistics about um, minorities leave state government at a faster rate than white, white employees um, at a much, a much faster rate, that's something that we need to continue to work on to improve and if you can make new employees for six months the first months for six months of their experience a satisfying experience they're much more apt to stay so it's also very agency dependent um, you, you know you can talk to individual employees and people say oh this is a great welcoming culture or you can talk to other employees and say that this is a horrible culture so it's really it's really how the individual perceives it and we need to make sure, as my job is to make sure that employees that come, we give them the best chance to succeed as employees. And okay. Okay. So, so that's what I meant by that. Okay. So getting to the structure. Yes. We have this board, and then we have um, a chief officer. We can talk about the title, but we have a chief officer. Right. Um, so you raised some of the obvious points with conflict, but I'm still confused. Are you saying that maybe this would be okay if it was appointed by the governor as a chief executive, or indirectly through the panel that the governor appoints? But then I, later on I heard you say, well, maybe just having a panel in an advisory capacity. So I'm confused, and I may not have been listening carefully enough to your words. Where is the administration? Um, do you support these, the appointment of a panel, however that's appointed, with the chief executive, or just an advisory panel without the chief executive, um, and is that a budgetary issue, or, or, or what? That's all. So, I'm just trying to get clarity. Right. So through an executive order, uh, the, the governor could do much of this work except for um, wouldn't have any um, authority over the judiciary or the legislature, but through an executive authority, the governor or, or the governor could create his own advisory panel to advise him and to advise the secretary on issues of systemic racism. And the governor also already does take advice from people regarding these issues. I mean, it's not so. Well, we can all get that right. advice. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, so, so. <laughs> I would say that a, a panel is not absolutely necessary to affect change. If there is to be a panel serving in an advisory capacity, that if the chief civil rights officer is going to be hired, that panel could review the applicants, seek applicants, make recommendations, but ultimately the leader of the executive branch where that position is, if that position is to sit within the executive branch in the administration, should be accountable to the leader, to the administrative leadership. So it should be accountable to the governor and the secretary of the administration. Okay, so, so let me ask the question a different way. <laughs> what if that person uh, resides in another one of these state buildings and not in the pavilion. And it's totally independent and not supported staff-wise uh, by the agency of administration. So it doesn't sit within the administration. Um, would you support that model? That model similar to a Human Rights Commission or an Ethics Commission. Right. 
would be a more difficult model to affect change if the goal is to affect cultural change in the um, within the administration, because it's, it would be somebody outside the administration um, either getting cooperation as the statute would require or demanding cooperation, but the amount of cooperation that they actually get would would not have the same impact as it would if the leadership was fully supportive of this position. And I think when you're having a separate entity that has a separate mission, you're not gonna have full leadership buy-in to affect the change. Okay, so you don't support a totally independent model? A, a totally independent model if there was a totally independent model, I think their charge would be different than what is in this bill right now. If it's if it's an ombud, ombuds, ombudsman that's going to be talking about issues and helping people and businesses and agencies across the state working, you know, it, it depends on what you want that person to be, if you want the person to be affecting change in state government, um, it's going to be hard to do that from outside. <coughs> questions for Beth? Thank you. Thank you. Now. Here all morning too, uh, and yet we are past our allotted time. Um, I hope it was informative, helpful to hear what everybody else had to say. Is it possible to uh, to, to be first on the list tomorrow morning? It is for me. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Madam Chairman, I wanted to mention that I was in t uh, contact with Kate Logan. Oh, uh, she, yes. she apologized, but would like to uh, be on the schedule for tomorrow, if possible. Okay. And how about yourself? Mm -hmm. I'm not testifying. Thank you. Oh, you're not. <laughs> okay. Well, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> Just one less person to try and shoot for. <laughs>